we are live. Yes. Welcome to O Seven's Kuliket, or internationally, Room Two O Five, View and Thoughts Film. So let's see. La, yeah, right. The this video is long. I realize that, and if you're only interested in the review, that is probably going to be most of the video. But it's not the entire thing. If you're only interested in the view, check the description for time codes, and you can, you know, judge if it is simply too long for you. Now, the the review itself, I'm most likely not going to include any spoilers. If I do spoil anything, I'll verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Once I'm done with the review, when I enter the thoughts section, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie. I will still be warning if I spoil something other than this movie. And hold up an index finger. Now, let's see. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the subject in another tab. And let's see. Yeah, so since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible I will touch my face. I want to assure you I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, I watched this with Danish audio with subtitles since I speak Danish, but I also honestly if I had access to the the dubbed version I might give it a whirl. I, I hear it's hilariously terrible. So, you know, even if you don't speak Danish uh, you know, it seems like it's better to just watch it in Danish and just have like, you know, English subtitles or something for it. But yeah. You know, not saying the movie is a perfect viewing experience if you watch it in Danish, but still. This is my second viewing. The first time I watched this was in 2010. I, and oh, right, I know nothing about the German remake. I don't think I even knew that it existed until I started doing research for this. I'm not ruling out that maybe at some point I'll watch it, but it's difficult to do a really great movie as a remake if the original wasn't that good you know I'm more interested in I'll probably watch more of I've watched some of the movies that this is clearly inspired by I'd like to watch more of them and yeah so the most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video so it's fresh in my mind now let's see yeah so plot when Catherine leaves home to attend college, she will be living in the dorm. There is some drama involving some of the other students. And she's told that there's a ghost in room 205. And when a mirror is broken, an evil spirit is released and people start dying. And Catherine is blamed. She has no choice but to solve the mystery and defeat the evil spirit. And this is one of the, I, I would say they do a pretty good job of not overexposing the evil spirit. There were times where I thought, okay, care, careful, you're not going to you know, show too much. And they would like cut to something else. So, yeah. There are a lot of movies where it doesn't really make sense that the characters don't believe the protagonist. Because clearly what they're saying about the supernatural makes sense and is real. Here they do legitimately think that she's losing her mind. Of course, it's hard to believe as an audience member that they think she's the one killing because of the nature of some of these killings. And no, the fact that that same weakness is part of an excellent movie like the original Nightmare on Elm Street doesn't make it okay for it to be here. It's not okay there either. I would definitely say in this movie, possibly also that one, but the thing with that one is it's part of this theme of like movies made for teenagers that kind of very much side with the teenagers that sometimes their parents just don't believe them, just don't listen to them for no good reason. And for that, it works well. We're here. It's, you know, it's, it's 20 somethings not believing other 20 somethings when it's, yeah. 
this movie should definitely have made a decision either make the kill something that the audience could believe the movie could, the characters in the movie could believe are done by Catherine now and you know Catherine also has these like visions and nightmares I'm not 100 percent sure why oh actually yep yeah, never mind I, th I think I know why I I'll I'll go into why in the in the spoiler sections. And let's see. You know what? Actually, I am just very briefly going to go into yeah. So spoilers for this movie until I lower my index finger. Catherine starts having these visions and nightmares because she broke the mirror and the Yeah, actually, I think I'll, I'll keep it vague, but anyway, you know, that's why it's Catherine and not someone who's lived in the dorm longer You know, and it's not just about living in her room because Rolf lived in her room recently and It doesn't really seem like he got nightmares and visions and such, but you know, even the the and it's not enough to be bullied because he was also bullied, but it's you know, once the mirror is broken. Wait a second, doesn't she have at least one of them before the mirror is broken? Actually, I'm not one hundred percent certain. No, I, I guess they do start after. Anyway, no more spoilers for this movie for the time being. So yeah, this is you know. I'm aware a lot of people have never heard of this movie. It is a horror movie from 2007, directed by, I'm going to guess it's pronounced, Martin Bonovitz. And so the concept. This movie has significant trouble deciding if it wants to be a drama about, well, drama in a college dorm. I've seen others compared to Mean Girls. I haven't watched that movie, but it does sound like, you know, based on what I have heard, you know, and, or, you know, maybe more something like, you know, so, something like Dangerous Liaisons. I've watched at least one of those movies, so that's, there's definitely some like going on. I personally hate the B word, so I'm not going to use it, so let's say that one of the girls is a real jerk. Let's go with that. And engages in jerky behavior. There are some who say that the drama is actually the main plot and the slow movie ghost story is secondary and yeah, kind of. It, it's like a, a significant chunk of this movie is about the drama, which like, to be fair, part of the trailer does sell it as a, a drama, but it really, no, the, this movie needed to make the choice. But anyway, yeah, if it wants to be a drama. If it wants to be a cheap knockoff of The Ring. Now, just briefly, I have watched the first two American Ring movies. The second of the Japanese ones, I am working on watching the first Japanese one. And, you know, for The Grudge, I watched the American remake of one. I haven't watched any of the other movies called Grudge. I have watched, you know, the... I'm gonna... Uh, I think Chinese, the I, you know, the, the, yeah, the I1, the I2, and the American remake of uh, the I1, and just, you know, just a couple of days ago, I rewatched both the original, the I, and the American remake of the I. I meant to watch the, the I2 as well, but I ran out of time, and yeah, you know, the, these, I, I don't own any of the Ring movies, own, own copies of any of the Ring movies, but I do own those three I movies, and yeah, you know, binged those two, wanted to make comparisons, because this, yeah, as I already mentioned, this definitely takes some inspiration from, you know, Asian horror movies. I will just briefly say, this movie, the, you know, the protagonist, woman is pretty like Jessica Alba, but she's also talented, unlike Jessica Alba. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, we Danes never make horror movies where the lead is more attractive than talented, but this isn't what she's, she's a good actress. She's legitimately a good actress. And, you know, there's maybe also some mirrors thrown in. I watched the first of those 
I'm aware there's at least one sequel. I haven't watched that. And it's been a while since I've watched Mirrors. I think it's 10 years or more. And yeah, it, you know, so to sum up, the movie can't make up its mind. If it's a drama a la Dangerous Liaisons, if it's Asian horror with some mirrors thrown in, or if it wants to be about Catherine losing her grip on reality, which the director says, you know, on the commentary track, in like interviews and such, he feels that this is a movie about Catherine losing her mind. One of the big problems with that idea is that clearly other people are seeing and experiencing weird things. It is possible to make a creepy, scary movie where some, you know, one particular person is losing their mind. Off the top of my head, you know, the, the Spanish movie Open Your Eyes later remade as Vanilla Sky. And, I mean, technically this is a spoiler, so spoilers for Open Your Eyes. Technically, that is not a horror movie, but it is a movie where it's very clear that the protagonist is seeing and experiencing things that those around him are not seeing and experiencing. No more spoilers for Open Your Eyes. So, yeah, it's just, it's, it's wild that the movie just keeps going between these, these completely... It's not impossible to make a horror movie that also has drama, but... It's more like, you know, this. It's, it's somewhat like with the Fear Games, which, you know, for a while I referred to that as a marriage between The Ring and, like, let's see, what's a good example? Uh, hmm. I guess, well, yeah, just, you know, a, a, a first-person shooter with, you know, slow-mo and cool guns and such. And for, yeah, for a while I referred to that as a marriage. And then someone in the, you know, commented on one of my videos on that series and said, but it's not really a marriage, is it? It's more like a timeshare. And that's why I now, I'm, I'm sorry, dude, I do not remember your handle, but you're 100% right if you're watching. It's just, yeah. So, yes, now I do refer to it as that, those games, they're fun games, for sure. And I, th I think it was kind of hard on the third game when I reviewed it. I've played it since, and I thought, oh, it's not that bad. But yeah, it's a timeshare, and that's what this movie is. It's like this really awkward of, of just... And sometimes it'll sh it'll, it won't, like, smoothly transition from one to the other. It's just, like, you know, horror and then drama. Horror and then more drama. And it's just... it Yeah, the, the movie has... A, a very real problem with that. It's not a terrible idea to center a horror movie on the experience of moving into a college dorm. It is essentially the first time that we are truly separated from our parents. I mean, unless you were unfortunate enough to get kicked out by your parents before then. And I guess in some cases that would be preferable to living with your parents, but I digress. Now, obviously, a lot of teenagers don't think that they still need their parents to protect them you know, when you're a child, you believe that your parents are the only ones who can protect you from evil. So experiencing evil that you are alone to face in a college dorm is, in theory, a good idea. There's, there's, I haven't watched every horror movie, so it's possible that a good horror movie has been made about that concept. But this ain't it, Chief. And I, yes, briefly, I'm talking faster than in some of my other more recent videos and you know like a month ago I wasn't talking quite this fast in my videos I have I have got to stop sitting in the same exact uh, position for too long because it's bad for my back but I can't I still have a lot of things to say about the movies that I watch so I talk faster that's why so let's see yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just briefly going to quote from my old written review. This could have been an excellent drama thriller about closed social environments or an effective piece of supernatural horror. All it had to do was make a choice of what to be instead of promising both and not completely delivering on either. If you think it succeeds at the, as the latter, try rewatching it and pick out all the filler and the portions that don't pay off. What we get is a film of two mismatched halves, and you can easily tell where they crudely overlap. 
wasted potential. Please, guys, get a better script next time. And that really, the the huge problem here is the script. And it really, I, if you watch this movie and you just like completely torn it apart, you don't. We don't have to. That's perfectly fine. But I do think the main problem here is the script. The technical aspects, I will be getting into that. Anyway, if we were to compare it directly to The American Ring 1, while that movie is not only about the mystery surrounding the VHS tape, everything else does have some relation to it. You know, the like Naomi Watts... Uh, let's see... Yeah, I, yeah, okay, so I can't really say the, the following without spoiling the ring, so brief spoilers for the American remake of the ring. Naomi Watts' child and her ex, you know, at both, both, they're not part of the mystery as such, but they relate to the mystery. The child watches the tape against Naomi Watts' wishes, wishes, sorry, and the ex helps with the investigation because he has expertise on video editing that she doesn't. Through the interactions between her and the child and the ex, we get some character development and background without it just being awkwardly shoved in unnaturally. Of course they're going to talk about their background when they talk about whether or not the ex is going to be a father to the child. No more spoilers for the ring for the time being. Where in this movie, basically the social environment of this college dorm doesn't really have anything directly to do with the evil spirit. So, yeah, if you're considering watching either this or The American Ring 1 or the Japanese Ringu 2, I, I recommend either of those over this. And I hear the Japanese Ringu, the, the first one, is also much better than this. So sometimes in these videos I go into, was this movie even worth making? I guess in this case, probably not, which is too bad, because from a technical standpoint, this is entirely competent. There are some very effective scares here. But yeah, you know, like, the, the, it would have been a, a better, you know, just, yeah, just like the, the, let's see, this is from 2007. The first American Ring is from 2001. I forget what year Ringu 2 is from, but yeah, you know, like, the people who put time and effort into this, it almost would have been better if they just, like, helped to get a re-release on DVD, or streaming service, the theaters, for, you know, the American Ring or Ringu 2. So, I will be criticizing this movie. I've already started. I do want to say this is the kind of thing that I could really enjoy. I don't, it, my problem with it is not that it's trying to be an Asian horror movie without the cast or crew being Asian. I don't think that necessarily has to be a bad thing, but it does seem like they didn't really understand what made those movies work. Or maybe just lacked the talent to recreate what made those movies work. So, let's see, yeah, the, the movie at times is about the plot, at times is more about the characters, and it is kind of this thing of, like, let's see, the, the, Yeah, it's, it's not a completely even, yeah, and, let's see, yeah, you know, they, they should have chosen one of these three movies and stuck with it. I think any of the three different movies it's trying to be would have been pretty decent by itself, but trying to do all of them, it's a mess. And... There are times where it's style over substance. It needed to explain more for, for some of these things. The, there needed to be more details to some of the lore. So, let's see. Let's... 
Right. So the title has, you know, special significance. The Danish title translates to either, you know, one, one of the following. The college dorm, the dorm, or the college. I've seen some say that it translates to hostel. I do not agree with that. But yeah, it's set in a college dorm. And room 205, the international title, is specifically the room that has a connection to the supernatural evil. Honestly, it's probably a better title. It's more intriguing. You know, may maybe calling it the college dorm, that was like... Honestly, at times it feels like this started out as, like... As if it's almost three scripts combined, like the the the, the screenwriter was working on three different scripts at a time, and after a while, just felt like I don't have enough material for a ninety-minute drama. I don't have enough material for a ninety-minute horror movie. I can't quite make it work for this movie to be about Catherine, the protagonist, losing her mind, and then it just combined them, and it's just yeah, and and calling it the college dorm would work for that drama, you know, dangerous liaisons, but in a college dorm. That makes, yeah. The reason I decided to review this, I think we Scandinavians are capable of making incredible movies, but every so often we make ones that are only average or downright bad, and I think it's useful to look at why some of them came out, come out great and others come out bad. I'm, I'm not doing this to, to dunk on our film, you know, yeah, I think we've made incredible films. Now, I, the, the reason I bought this is I found it on sale, you know, and I like supernatural horror. I think we're capable of making great movies. I was hoping this would be one. I'm not criticizing it because I'm disappointed or frustrated. And let's see. yeah, so subgenres, you know, as a teen drama, it's decent enough. As supernatural horror, the the supernatural horror scenes and segments of the film are actually de decent, bordering on good. Certainly, the if if you if you like. If you focus only on those, and you just really let yourself get into them, most of them are good. The movie is scary. The movie is legitimately scary, and has some really memorable horror movie elements. And if just if the whole movie had been the, the horror movie, then this would be a very different review. I would be singing its praises. So this was the, the screenplay was written by okay I'm just I'm gonna try Yannick Tai Mosholt who has written several you know yeah he's written a bunch of other movies let's see the war game anti I did not realize hmm okay I'm just gonna try directly translating these titles into English the travel to the uh, the Kingdom of the Feather King, You and Me Forever, which was the storyline, this, The Gigantic Bear, and yeah, he wrote Hold Me Tightly. That, that one is a much better teen drama than this is. That's, I have very few issues with that movie, and, you know, yeah, I reviewed it back when it came out in 2010, and yeah, it's, it's a really great, he, he's capable of writing really compelling teen drama. And, yeah, just, again, going to, going to my old point of view. Plot is severely underdeveloped, essentially unoriginal, as I already mentioned, and clearly merely exists to stage the terror, which, again, is great. The script is the major problem. It drags everything other than the technical aspects down with it. The writing of plot, characters, dialogue, individual scenes, how they work together to, to create a whole, all of these things have issues because of the screenplay. 
Now, yeah, the I forgot I had to copy this into the review, but I noticed that on this viewing again. In one bit, a couple of people are laughing in sort of background, and it gets to be excessive. No one goes on for that long, and it costs credibility. And it just, it's its too bad, because the they really, it's, it's the, like, I don't know if it's ADR or if they did get it on set, but it is, like, it's the editing. It's not that you see this person laughing all the time. So if they just manage to... to tone it down a little bit, trim it a little bit, have another sound effect then laughing or something. But that's that's something I find to be a, a problem with a lot of our movies. Just scenes go on for too long, characters are pushed a little bit too hard. You know, the the I I have a lot of praises for the hunt. But in one scene of that movie yeah, I guess, okay, so the following is a spoiler, so spoilers for the hunt. The The protagonist is believed, you know, he's he's accused of being a pedophile, and a lot of people believe it. So in one scene, he goes to do shopping, and the people there, like, they won't, let's see, I think it starts with that they won't sell, like, you know, he has to give them money to be able to walk out with the stuff he bought legally, and they won't take his money. They refuse to, to sell him anything. And then they, like, I forget if it's, I don't remember exactly when it starts, if it starts in the store or if he walks out first, but at some point they start throwing cans of food at his, like, directly at, like, at his head. And this keeps, and this is still going on when he's outside of the shop. And it's just at that point, no one would do this. No one behaves like this in real life. Not so, certainly not someone who's stable enough to have a job selling food. Like if if they're going to do something like that, they're also going to be doing other things that make, you know, that mean that they can't work like that. Anyway, no more spoilers for the hunt for the time being. So yeah, the the some of the plot twists are handled very badly. There's at least one plot twist too many. And yeah, some of the plot twists are bad. Some of them too easy to figure out for the viewer. It, it it's not the kind of movie where it's difficult to keep up with all the twists. It's difficult to believe all the twists, but it's not difficult to keep up. And yeah, so the direction I try to go into, if it's focused or aimless, at times it's very focused, but then at other times it's, you know, the, the focus completely changes to something else, and just, yeah. Now, let's see, I don't think I've watched anything else that Martin Bonovitz has directed. And I did not copy in, I'm not sure if he has directed other stuff, I didn't copy it in here. And... Yeah, so the opening pretty quickly sets up the, the core concept of Catherine leaving for the college dorm, and like clearly her father is not really happy that it's happening. But it's you get the sense that she kind of, she, you know, yeah, very early in the film, it, it becomes clear she really wanted to leave home. Like it's where she lived was maybe pretty boring and just yeah you know she wants new experiences which is part of what college is all about and yeah so the let's see yeah so Again, quoting from my old IMDb review, there are gaping holes, the non-existent fleshing out keeps us from caring when anyone dies, and spoilers for this movie, near the ending it gets even worse. The very last shot is cheap, sacrificing a chunk of the value of the overall concept for a jump scare that makes little sense. No more spoilers for the time being. And let's see.
But yeah, I mean, the, the ending, you kind of get how things happened the way they happened and why the ending is the way it is. And I would say there, there are... Hmm, I'm not sure I would say that the movie loses your interest along the way, but it does get frustrating when it goes, you know, yeah, switches between drama, supernatural horror, and Catherine is losing her mind. Now, yeah, like, you know, like I mentioned, the, the movie definitely... The people who made this movie clearly have watched really excellent Asian horror movies and they wanted to try to make one themselves and didn't quite... yeah. Now, let's see... Hmm, I guess technically the following is kind of a spoiler, so yeah. Spoilers for this movie. You know, the 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 evil spirit will like, you know, if if the evil spirit is targeting someone, that person will see their reflection in a mirror as if their like their face is bleeding or their their neck is bleeding or something, which means we know they're about to die, and we worry how, at least in theory, but you don't really like it. Almost none of the people that we see attacked are characters that we actually like or care about. So, anyway, no more spoilers for the time being. So, let's see. Yeah, so the. I don't have a lot to say about the characters. Let's see, the. the I do briefly want to say, you know, Mira Wanting plays Lena in this R.I.P. She was very, very talented. I quite liked her on the TV show Villeleune, or in English, White Lies. And she appears in Love at First Hiccup. 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 I, yeah, anyway. I watched that movie because I really like the author of the book and I there was a while where I watched every movie he had something to do with I have not watched the sequels and that is something that I am very very happy to not have done I'm not sure that was even really a concept that could sustain more than one story but anyway Yeah, so, some more from my old MDB review. It costs credibility, as does the one-note single trait, innocent, evil, two-faced, etc. Characters with what can be a seriously messed up logic. And, yeah, you know, as a viewer, we, we empathize with the protagonist, not with any of the antagonists. And that is the idea. You know, basically the protagonist is this fairly bland, positive depiction. And the antagonist is kind of a cartoon character, ridiculously mean. And, let's see. You know, I, I don't think it, it's... It, it, the movie would be better. I, I do think the movie would be better if the characterizations were a lot better. And... Yeah, so, as far as the acting goes, again, from my old review, see, I would argue that the acting in this is good, and they, particularly the leads, certainly tend to be natural. They simply aren't allowed to truly explore their roles. I think all of this goes for many of our mainstream productions, and that's, yeah, I, I can't point to a single bad acting performance in this. It's just that, like, they make the most of it, but the things they have to say and do the actions they have to take are just ridiculous so much of the time. It's just, you can't really believe what the, the, 
yeah. And they do they do their best. And it's the acting could be a lot worse. Now the uh, yeah, the dialogue is also quite it's it's like I said, the delivery itself is pretty good for the dialogue, but the writing is really bad. Like no one talks like this. And actually, yeah, a, a Danish guest reviewer wrote, it doesn't hold up. It's like it was written by someone in seventh grade. No one could make the lines sound natural. And so, yeah, you know, the, the characterization, there's really not very much. There, there are some, like, things that get brought up, and, I like, they're supposed to matter, but then they don't matter that much. Yeah. And, yeah, so the cinematography was done by Mikhail Valentin. And, let's see, yeah, the, the, right, yeah, I'm, I'm going to briefly quote another reviewer here. Focus and lighting are toyed with when the evil spirit appears to characters, making it distinctly making it distinctly different than the normal events. And yeah, so the editing was done by, but but yeah, just really briefly, it is rem, just tremendously successful. I, I I'm not 100% certain if he has DP'd other horror movies, but that certainly would like it. He did an incredible job on this. And the editor also does some really great work, Benjamin Binoff. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, my only interview review, there are scenes that serve no purpose other than to add more fear-inducing stuff, the early gratuitous dream sequences, for example. And it's the kind of, you know, I'm not saying that those scenes are badly edited. I'm saying that, uh, let's see, I think if, if it's been too long since I watched, since I last rewatched folding ideas video on editing in the Suicide Squad. So I think it's called structural editing. If a scene doesn't add to the movie, it should be removed. And if it happens too early or too late, it should be changed in the order. And yeah, some of these scenes essentially should have been removed. I'm not 100% certain if we like I know some like American movie theaters have a rule that a movie has to be at least 90 minutes or they won't consider it a feature film so they won't show it I think that might be some of what this yeah now you know I, again I, I think I guess the the nightmares and such are supposed to be a let's see they're supposed to get across that she's basically losing her mind or losing her grip on reality, but other people are seeing messed up stuff too. And for some reason, it doesn't seem like they're losing their mind. You know, you, you can do that. You can make a movie where multiple characters feel like the things that are happening around them are too crazy that almost they, they can't be real off the top of my head, end of the line does a quite good job of that. You know, the the circumstances are so outlandish that several of the characters are like, this can't be real. Like, we, I mean, this must be like, some, you know, and that's not the, you know, that doesn't happen here. So we just were left wondering why is, I, I get why she's being affected. I'm not sure I should say why without spoiling. I, I can say why without spoiling something, but why doesn't it affect the others? In a, like, honestly, the fact that Catherine is is like, you know, I'm not sure. I I really see it. See the. I would agree that the film is depicting that she's losing her grip on reality, but certainly she is having some horrible nightmares. And she is experiencing some things. Those affect her the way that they would affect normal people. But when other characters in the film, like, see something or hear something that's just, you know, completely, you know, a lot of those characters don't really see. Oh, actually, they, they tend to blame Catherine, which makes no sense because it's not, it's, yeah. 
but yeah, you know, for comparison, some movies where the dream sequences do serve a purpose, uh, you know, Aliens, Prince of Darkness, The Day of the Dead, The Fly, Vertigo, Carrie, and let's see. Right, so yeah, the, the special effects are very well done, very convincing, and the the stunt work is good, and there's, I would say there's the right amount of both special effects and stunts, and yeah, like the, the in, in both cases, they're very effective. Like, you watch those scenes, and it really, like, it's, it's gripping, it's effective. It's the stuff surrounding it that's nonsense. Yeah. So, this was filmed in Amma, Point Soi. And they actually, they found a closed down retirement home. I suppose one could refer to it as a retired retirement home. And they used that as the inside of the college dorm. And the cast described that it was creepy to be there. They make really, really great use of it. It's like, honestly, honestly, I wouldn't rule out, I don't think this is the case, but I wouldn't rule out that they were like, they were going to sh do, you know, they, they had a s full script for dangerous liaisons in a college dorm. They were going to film it. Then they came across this, this, this location, and they were like, we, we got to make some horror scenes here. But they didn't have enough ideas for a full horror movie, so they just, you know, they, they removed some of the pages from the da dangerous liaisons in a college dorm script, and put in horror movie scenes because it really yeah it's it's very very effective and and honestly yeah I've on, honestly almost worth watching the movie for it really is a great location there are a lot of horror movies that have great locations I'm not sure I've seen one that has one that's quite like this now so yeah so the horror scenes the director describes that Catherine is losing her grip on reality and wanting to make it psychological horror, having characters calling them crazy, using sound visuals to underline it or isolation, and they put a lot of effort into the photo work, and it was great. And yeah, like I, I can kind of see what, but it's just like the characters who, the other characters who say that she's crazy, it doesn't make any sense for them to say that because it seems like. They're seeing, and yeah, there are times where they definitely saw or heard something that would mean they should think that something weird is going on, not that she's losing her mind. And then there are a few scenes where it's not 100% clear if she's the one seeing it or several are, but anyway. And... Let's see... Hmm... I, yeah, okay, so technically the following is spoilers, but I'm, yeah, spoilers for the movie. The evil spirit, who they, you know, can attack you if there's a mirror nearby, you know, in the ring, it's a TV, and, yeah, they, they use that quite well to, to scary effect, and some people call this a slasher movie, it's not quite a slasher movie, I, I can kind of see what they mean, there, there's young people, some of them have sex, some of them end up dead, just these kinds of things, but not quite a slash movie. No more spoilers for the movie for the time being. They put a lot of effort into making the evil spirit look creepy, and they actually talk about they were careful to... They didn't want to go overboard, they didn't want it to look ridiculous, and they did a really great job. And, yeah, there are some jump scares where they use stinger audio, very effective, and tension and suspense. And, let's see, so, yeah, as a, let's see, it is, yeah, supernatural horror, ghost story, psychological horror. I think some people would call it a splatter film. I don't think they quite go far enough for it to be, I mean, splatter film, I guess that's that's more like, Ah, Peter Jackson's early movies, you know, before the Lord of the Rings. And 
yeah, you know, I, I think some, I really like those genres of horror, and yeah, when, when this gets it right, it really is very, very scary, very creepy, very atmospheric, and let's see. The evil spirit also isn't quite, like, in theory she's interesting, but they don't flesh out the lore enough. Uh, you know, again, like, comparatively, like, Samara, I want to say it's her name in the Ring movies, she, you know, we, by the end of, of the first movie, we know a lot about her. You know, at the start, she's very mysterious, and over the course of the film, we learn more and more. By the end, we know a lot. By the end of this, we still don't know that much. Like, there, there's a few really key details, but it's, it's just not... And that really, I mean, if instead of the teen drama, if they had more scenes of, like, discovering the lore of the evil spirit, that would have been a lot more... Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, it's possible that it's actually, that maybe they were always going to do a horror movie and they were like scouting locations, not sure what kind of horror movie they were going to make. And they found this old retirement home and they were like, this place is scary. But it also kind of looks like a college dorm. Maybe we could do a college dorm drama. And let's see. So yeah, it, the, the scenes are easy to follow. They're meant to... And I would definitely say that was the right decision. This would not have been a better movie if it was like David Lynchian kind of vague and weird and having to really interpret. And yeah, some of the music is loud and aggressive. Some of it's soft and subtle. And the music does a good job of building suspense and tension. And so, yeah, the types of comedy are blue and black. Sometimes we laugh with the characters, sometimes at them, sometimes... And let's see. You know, it's, it's not especially funny. The, the jokes are mostly there to illustrate that these are people who are very mean-spirited. They make very mean-spirited jokes about each other. Excuse me. And, yeah, so as far as violence and gore, there's only a little, but it is fairly effective. And, let's see, yeah, so sexual material, uh, yeah. Spoiler for the movie. There's, there's a rape scene, and it's, I really appreciate that they don't, like, it's, I suppose it is arguably a little exploitative. But it could be a lot worse. I think they, they tried to make it as... They, they tried to make it not be exploitative. Other than the rape, there's... You know, the, the sexual material, there's a little, is mostly mild. No more spoilers for the time being. Now, I think... I think they do a pretty good job of the, like... Okay, so an argument could be made that it should have more violence for the kind of horror movie that it is. I, yeah, maybe at least a little bit, yeah. But other than that, like the amount of it, the the tone of it, the amount of sex, and the way that's handled, it, yeah, it's a it's the right, like, ah, what's it called? The the. They handled it right, I would say. And, yeah, so as far as the level of realism, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, this is fairly realistic and credible. Probably the biggest is that these characters often behave nothing like real people. And, yeah, so the pacing goes back and forth be between moving ahead nicely and slowing down and getting distracted. Like, for the first chunk of it, when, like, the, the drama, when 
yeah, you you know, you get into it. It it works. Now the movie is an hour and twenty seven and a half minutes long. And I mean if you really if you get into the drama, you almost might as well switch it off once you like you'll you'll know when it really go you know, when the when the timeshare agreement means that the horror movie has to start. If you you know, if you watch the if you watch further than that and you get into the horror, it's worth watching the rest of it, I would say. But yeah, I mean, like, the first 30 minutes or so, maybe, yeah, 30 or 40 minutes in or so, is a good time to take stock of if you want to stay. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the, these are, the following are the other Danish horror movies that I have watched. Bete Stille Uber, internationally known as Rest of the Souls, Mørkelej, internationally known as Backstand, Sister Team, internationally known as Final Hour, and respectively, I gave those 5 out of 10, 5 out of 10, and 7 out of 10. And yes, the reason I watched those is because I'm a huge fan of the author of the scripts, Dennis Jokinson, and his many, many, many books. I've read basically every single one that I could get my hands on, which for a long time was most of them. I actually don't know. If you know if he's still writing a lot, and Nedemaken Night Watch, which I gave an eight out of ten, that is probably the best Danish horror movie I've seen, the one that the most really holds up, and again I haven't watched all of them. Now, let's see. Yeah, so it's it's a fairly, you know, from, like, moral standpoint and that kind of thing, the movie doesn't really have a very nuanced perspective. It kind of says that there are good people and evil people. Evil pe people bully good people. So, yeah, the, the best element of the film, the scares are very effective. The, yeah, really, the, the, the scares and the whole, like... Think the what's the right way to put it? The way they use the retirement home for scares is legitimately like if if that sounds like it's appealing to you, the movie does a, a pretty good job. You know, as long as you can accept that the overall movie is not that great, then it is almost worth watching just once. You know, I'd like to say that, oh, just watch those scenes, but if you don't watch the entire movie, there's going to be stuff that's not going to make any sense to you. But yeah, the, the worst thing about the movie is definitely the scripts. Closely followed by its unwillingness to simply choose what movie it wants to be, and then stick with that one. And, you know, if if you do watch it, and you you know, you want to, you want a way to prepare to, you know, so it isn't, so it doesn't hit as hard that it's, that the script is so bad. It'll be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing, and I guess some people would simply prefer to stop watching the movie when it starts turning into something else. Now, I would say, let's see. Yeah, something I saw others criticize of it is it's too derivative of Asian horror without understanding it. And yeah, you know, if you if you lower your expectations, you might still like. And let's see, I hmm, what was I most worried about going into this film? I think yeah, the script. And sadly the movie lived down to my expectations. And what I was most looking forward to were the scares, and the movie exceeded them. Exceeded my expectations on that. Let's see. The movie, yeah, the various movies I've mentioned, the, the various Danish horror movies I've mentioned, 
all of them have at least some effective scares. And, you know, obviously it would be better if they were great movies overall. But I have seen horror movies that from start to finish have no effective scares. And that's really frustrating. It, of, obviously there are some movies that are not actually trying to be scary. But I'm talking about movies that are trying to be scary. And... Yeah, so, you know, the technical crew do a really good job. I'd, I'd like to watch other stuff they worked on. Is the movie entertaining to watch? Some of the time, definitely. And, let's see. It is definitely a movie that will leave many viewers depressed. And I'm not talking about because it can't take a lame stick to it. It goes to some very upsetting material and... I mean, I've kind of already said, yeah, I mean, hypothetically, if you didn't, if you skip past the other spoiler sections, brief spoilers for this movie, it goes into gang rape. No more spoilers for this movie. So you can see how that might be depressing to watch. And, yeah, it, it does leave you in a negative state of mind. I'm, I think it is meant to. As a whole, it is not good. But it does have some good parts. And let's see. So, right, mysteries. I, again, copied in something from my old IMDb review. Every conclusion about the ghost is reached by guesswork, yet it guides numerous of their actions. This underlines the issue that they don't reveal much about it. While mystery is not a bad thing, you can't expect it to have an impact when the protagonist, when what the protagonist is doing, lacks a solid basis. As straightforward a story as this, the audience should never ask why someone they're meant to side with is doing what they're doing. And yeah, that's definitely a problem. I'm not sure I would really say it leaves a lot of unanswered questions. I would say, ultimately, by the end of the movie, I'm not sure there are really unanswered questions left. The trailers do not give too much away. They do give a good idea of what the movie is like. So, you know, if you like the trailer, you might like the movie. If you don't like the trailer, you won't like the movie. The teaser and the trailer are both safe to watch before you watch the movie. The stuff they, that could give things away flashes by so fast that you don't get a strong idea of what it is. You just know that there's something like that in the movie, you know, including some of the death scenes. And, yeah, it's, you know, and, and something that actually works really well. The, the main trailer, not the teaser, but the main trailer does actually start out looking like it is a teen drama at a college dorm, you know. And then it goes into horror movie mode. So, yeah, it's, it might be the most accurate trailer I've seen in a long time, actually. The yeah. Now the cover and poster do not give away too much. And I mean they they do a decent enough job of giving you a sense of the 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 kind of movie or yes, not the kind of movie, but the sort of the tone of the movie. So yeah, if you if you like the cover or poster, you might like the movie, and if you don't, you might not. The movie doesn't have a lot of metaphor, difficult to understand elements. You don't need to watch more than once to understand it. And yeah, so sometimes I go into what is the first shot or scene of the movie. The very first thing you see in this you know, if I if you're Danish or you've watched a bunch of Danish movies, me saying the words Nordisk film logo, that's not like a huge surprise to you. It's like, oh yeah, whatever. They do a really cool, like scary version of the logo. It's it's really, really cool as a sort of like I, I think in the commentary track the director talks about that, you know, he was happy that they let him like destroy the logo with like and it's like audio distortions and like visual just it's it's really good and it really gives you a sense that 
this is going to be a horror movie, you know. And then there's this theme-appropriate nightmare title reveal. And then we have the first actual scene. Catherine in tight close-up driving to the college dorm. Her face essentially the only thing in focus. Everything else feels ethereal, full of hope and opportunity. And then Catherine moves into the college dorm, arguing with her father about it. It's clear he doesn't want her to go. And, you know, since the movie is in part about her, her relationship with reality and how she feels about living in the college dorm, it's legitimately a good setup. You know, you, you can really see how the they had good ideas. At, at least at times, they understood how to make the... Yeah, what, what they were doing make it work. Yeah, sometimes in these I go into whether the film should actually just have been an episode of The Twilight Zone or Outer Limits. I think that might actually have been. I think, because, like I said, it's not the whole movie that's a horror movie. If they just took, but then I'm not sure. I don't know if we do shows like that. I don't watch Danish television. I haven't for quite some years now. The the I don't watch television at all anymore. I don't even get the signal. The, excuse me, so the, the, right, since there's not enough material, it should have just been, like, but then I guess the, the crew would have had to go to a, another country possibly, I, yeah, I'm really not sure that we make shows like that, I, I, I've seen some drama shows, like White Lies was a drama show. But anyway, the, the, yeah, so, ah, let's see. I think that would have been a, a good way to, to do it. If they had just, you know, done, yeah, done it as a script for a Twilight Zone episode and sold that. And, yeah. I have some suggestions for how to fix the movie. Or, you know, I have some suggestions for greatly improving the movie. And they will be in the notes taken before watching section. Yeah, I mean, how to how to completely fix the movie is basically the, you know, pick one of the three movies and just only make that one movie. So the tomato meter, there is no critic score. The user score is twenty one percent. So that's, yeah, and. That's the thing, like, I, let's see, I think that's supposed to be that, like, most of the people who went and voted for it voted very low. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm going to say what my rating is in just a few minutes, but 21, that is very, very low. I would not give that low a rating. Anyway, you know, like, uh, let's see, I guess the worst horror movie I've ever watched would be U Bowl's or is it U Bowl? The House of the Dead, the first House of the Dead movie. And no, it's not just because I love those games. I would hate that movie even I hated those games. But yeah, if you've watched me for a while, you might know that I really, really love the House of the Dead games. Like, okay, not all of them equally, but like they're I really, really love several of those games so but but yeah you know and I you know in in the in on Rotten Tomatoes and the user you know so yeah like I mentioned there I don't think there's a single critic review on Rotten Tomatoes for this movie but the user reviews the last one seems to be from like 2012 so I'm not sure anyone since then but me has cared but yeah I can live with that and on Metacritic, it's not even up. On IMDb, it has a 4.4. I'm not really... I don't think I would rate this lower than a 5 out of 10. I really do think that's... Yeah. I, I just... I agree. It's not a good movie. But let's please not pretend like it's the worst movie ever made. You know, the... the 
there are substantially worse. I would definitely say Backstabbed is a worse horror movie than this. Like, that movie, like, there are times in that movie where the lighting is so low that you can't even properly see what's going on. That's not, that's not okay for a horror movie. I'm not, you know, sometimes you're not supposed to be able to tell what's going on, but the way that it's filmed and edited makes it clear that they thought you'd be able to tell what's going on, you know. And I don't take any pleasure in saying that because that movie was directed by the director of Final Hour, and I love that movie. You know, I, I can't, in good faith, give it more than a 7 out of 10, but as a personal, like, I, th I think when I did a video on it, I... I said that my personal vote would be like 9 out of 10. I really love that movie and love that book as well. Now, let's see. Yeah, and the movie is rated R by the MPAA. That makes a lot of sense. And let's see. I mean, ultimately, if you... You know, you'll get more enjoyment, you'll get a stronger emotional response from watching this than if you just read the Wikipedia summary. But that's not exactly a, that's a very low bar to, to clear. So I, I recommend this to those who insist on watching every horror movie with ghosts or people like me who just, like, I think we can make really great horror movies and it I think it's important to call out when it doesn't work but also praise when they work or at least praise the elements that work if you do have a choice of like either streaming it or getting on on DVD the DVD not only has good extras but is one of those fun ones where they put effort into the menus so yeah um, my own quote unquote yeah my my rating for this is five different horror movies at the same time out of ten and yeah like i saw some people give like this a one out of ten like again you bowls house of the dead that's a one out of ten and i i when i wrote that it's been a couple of weeks now since i wrote that but i do remember what i thought exactly exactly what I thought after writing that, that I almost added. I'm not saying that there's no talent on display in that movie at all. I'm saying that any talent on display is completely ruined by something else. You know, I... I there's, a, there's a part of the movie where there's apparently like this... this spinny thing that like let's see is it the actor or is it the camera i'm not 100 maybe it's both but like they they use that to like have the camera you know it's not quite the bullet time 360 but it's like maybe a 180 or something and the first time i saw that in the movie i didn't think it fit but i did think that's that's kind of neat but then the movie kept doing it i think it does it like Five times in a row, like in a very short, I mean, maybe not right after each other, but in a very short, like maybe five times within two or three minutes. And it's like, why would you do that? Just, you, you can't just, you can't hit the same button over and over and expect us to get a reaction. So, you know, like if it had only done that once, maybe I would have given that movie a two out of ten. But because it did it over and over, like it stops having an effect and you end up just being... A frustrated person sitting and watching an incompetent buffoon like if a monkey had like climbed across the the uh in the instrument board or you know as they were editing i don't think that monkey could have made it any worse i think there's a chance the monkey would have done a better job than you bull and it's just like i get that he filmed it that way but then once he was editing why not just pick the one you think is the best and then only use that one but no he just put all of them in and you know it was it was back when he was making i, th I think he stopped but for a while you know for, for those who don't know you bowl is a german filmmaker and there was like a loophole in the german tax law that said that if you made 
a movie, but it didn't make money, then you didn't have to pay very much in taxes or something like that. And for a while, he did, you know, he was basically the producer in real life, you know, and the, I, th I think eventually he did stop. And I haven't, I don't think I've watched any other movie by him than that one. That one was bad enough. I, I don't think, I don't think the guy who directed that can make a good movie. I don't think it ha he has it in him. And the, I, I mean, I would be ashamed if one of my movies was even half as bad as that, you know. Anyway, the, the, you know, I've, I've never made, like, a movie movie, but the short films I've made are substantially better than House of the Dead. Anyway, let's see. Yeah, so the, the, I've heard some people say that his movies have gotten a lot more boring now that he's not intentionally making bad movies. I could see that. I could definitely see that they would be more boring if they weren't so intentionally bad. But, yeah. That brings us to the start of the thoughts section. So from here on out, I will not be warning when I spoil this movie. I will be spoiling. I will be warning when I spoil before I spoil anything else. But that brings us to the first thought section. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep it short and long, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimer, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion I'm going may be in this section. I realize that it isn't long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, we talked about spoilers. And. So yeah, content warning and or trigger warning, I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of the movie Gang Rape, Gaslighting, Bullying, and I'm not sure I'm going to be criticizing the violence and gore, but just in case, The Thing is one of my favorite horror movies and movies in general, I was love Chromebooks, The Fly, Video Zone, etc. I have no problem with violence and gore in movies, and as, as a general thing, I, there might be some situations where I don't, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. I just don't have a problem with film sexuality, nudity, disturbing and upsetting material in general. Monsters are one of my favorite movies. Now, let's see. There are relatively few sections, situations where rape should appear in fiction. Ideally, it should explore what rape does to survivors. It should not be erotic, funny, throwaway. It should not be in the movie simply to motivate a man to get revenge for someone raping one of his loved ones. And see, that's the thing, like, this isn't really a movie about what rape does to someone. The rape is why she's an evil spirit. You know, that that's part of the, the dark secret tragedy thing, backstory for the evil spirit, you know. But at the end of the day, like, it didn't actually have to be that. Like, hypothetically, it could have been bullying. I think the movie would actually be stronger for, for that. But like I said, I appreciate that they didn't film it. They, they weren't making it, like, extremely exploitative or something, but, you know, it's basically, it's the motive for revenge. I think if the movie had changed it so that she was, she was bullied a lot, and, like, I mean, you could still have, like, I don't know if, let's see. Yeah, I mean, the, the, let's see. Part of her death is that the... Let's see, she, she, you know, like the, the shower, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% certain exactly who it was that turned the shower on. I'm not entirely sure anyone did it on purpose, but anyway, so, you know, she got covered in water and then the stereo playing loud music got knocked over. And she was electrocuted to death. You could still do that with bullying. You know, actually the bullying could be that they like, force her under the shower in a, you know, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, like, the, the, what's it called, maybe they, like, cover her face so that it's like, ah, uh, like a, like a waterboarding thing, 
and then something similar happens to Catherine, but we don't know exactly who did it. And see, it's not that difficult to make this movie substantially better than it is. It really, like, there's immediately, there's several major things that would make it. If the evil spirit was, you know, if, if she was, like, getting revenge on bullies, I think that would actually, yeah, you know what? For a lot of it, it doesn't attack Rolf or Catherine, and then there near the end, it does start to, which, you know, so we realize, okay, it's not just going after bullies. Hypothetically, if once Sane was dead, I think there's a chance, that, like, you know, at that point, like, Rolf and, and Catherine see the, the evil spirit, but she doesn't do anything to them. And so they don't try to defeat her. And maybe, like, actually, yeah, maybe it turns out that, like, let's see, she could, ah, uh, let's see. I mean, apparently she can teleport between mirrors. So hypothetically, maybe, maybe the first mirror, maybe the mirror that she came out of, maybe that needs to be near those mirrors and they realize that. And so they, like, go to a place that's, like, known for having really vicious bullies or something, and they just leave the mirror there, and, like, they, yeah, and, and as they're leaving, like, someone shouts a slur after them or something, trying to bully them, and they just look at each other, smile, knowing that that bully is going to be murdered by this evil spirit, and then they walk off and, you know, fade to black and chilling music playing you know, that would be an awesome ending. That would be so much better of an ending that the movie does have. Anyway, I might swear in this video for those bothered by that. So, yeah, real quick. I got this movie on sale. Anything they were saying this is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to, for example, the Ring movies. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. I mean, really, I can't point to a single person here who's, like I said, who's, who's completely at fault. Like I said, the, I think the big problem is the script. The screenwriter did a great job on Hold Me Tightly. And I mean, he wrote, that movie came out three years later, so I, I mean, I guess it's possible that he just got way better of a writer in just three years, but it just, I don't know, I don't know how it happened, but everyone, like, it's, you know, directing, editing, cinematography, acting, all of this, there's, there's a lot of talent on display. I, I really, I'd like to see them make other movies similar or dissimilar. Now, let's see. I don't even remember if the if there are memorable quotes listed for this one. I don't think so. Now, you know, usually I say at this point in the video that I either love or hate all the lines depending on which it is, and that's why I'm not just gonna quote all of them, but yeah. So I right. The rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts, analysis, MSC3, riff tracks, and other jokes. And, so, yeah, time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section at, right after this one is thoughts I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as either running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts I have before watching. And the final section I get into stuff I think is what I'll begin into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, and the Wikipedia. And my back is killing me. Okay, so I'm going to have to speed up. So, let's see, really quick. Okay. Sometimes I leave in a lot of text that I'm not going to read aloud. Maybe I need to get better at that. So, right, yeah. So, horror movies often treat women very badly. Let's see, disposable, misogynist tropes, useless, not strong, sexualized against the will, and are only for that purpose, sexually so very now film exploring the effects of it. So I already mentioned the you know, it doesn't explore the, the effects of it. 
it, it doesn't count to say that that's what she's avenging. You know, plenty of ghost stories, it's murder that they're avenging. Mur murdering a person is not the same thing as raping them. You know, raping them, that's something they have to live with. That's something that, you know, but the, anyway, yeah. So the, okay, the, the, so yeah, both, I don't know, should I call her Lena or Mira Wanti? I'm probably going to go back and forth. Lena and Sane both, see, technically, if I pronounce it in Danish, it's Sane, but then I, I, I think I'm just going to keep calling her Sane. Let's see, the, the, um, yeah, I guess I could call her Sandy. That would work. It's just because the, the, when I voice type these notes, I do it in English. And if I say a Danish word, it's not going to understand. It's going to write something completely different. So, yeah, I think I'll go, if so, Sandy and Lena are pretty, you know, the, the way they're depicted, it's, it's kind of misogynist. But Catherine herself is strong. So, yeah, the, let's see, the, yeah, the movie is half and half on whether it's a good, it does well at that. Let's see, I guess that is, yeah, that's it for this section. So, getting into the next section. Notes taken while watching. So, in the elevator, her father expresses some concern. You get the sense that she's really sold on the idea of, excuse me, of moving away from home, and he doesn't. And I agree with the father that, Bully, that Sandy really should pick up the, help them pick up the land. But are we supposed to think that she broke it intentionally? I mean... It looked like an accident. Okay, so for sure she meant to bump into Rolf. So I guess we are supposed to think that she broke the lamp on purpose too. So as I said, the cast are talented. I feel bad for Mira wanting for being made to laugh so many times in such a short scene. It's very literally fake. They're trying to establish an atmosphere. And they're relying too much on certain things to do it such as that laugh. I mean, I guess the broken lamp is also supposed to mean that Catherine is clumsy. I mean, really, what exactly are we supposed to take from that, you know, is is it that she's clumsy? Is it that the other girl is someone who intentionally breaks people's things? Is it some of both? Because, I mean, certainly, like, some bullies do break things that matter to the person they're targeting. You know, that's one of the, ah, what's it called? That's one bullying tactic. So, but the way they filmed it, it looked like she didn't do it on purpose. They could easily have made it. Yeah, it's just really, anyway. I mean, Lucas is supposed to be at least slightly creepy, right? For just walking in when she's there in her underwear. And I, I know some people hate when I talk about this, but the movie really, like, the movie keeps inventing reasons, and it's really bad. Like it's it's like a it, it's like a creepy guy who's who's like making really bad excuses. Like there was that radio host that like pretend like he no, no no I was just taking a picture of this random wall. The fact that an attractive woman was in the shot when I took the picture is completely random. You know it's like okay we get it you you think that she has a great ass and you want to put it on screen. We get it, but like, you know, first we have that, you know, she stands up and, and pulls like her, her t-shirt down to, to cover, which it's like, until that, she barely acted like she was, she didn't like that he was there when she's in her underwear. Then you have later when there's like that thing that, let's see, is it, is it the cell phone? I don't, I don't even remember what the, I'm not sure. What even was the point of that shot? But there's like a shot where she walks into shot and doesn't, you know, and the camera is just focusing on, like, it's a crotch level. And it's just like, what is this? What are you doing, movie? You, 
I know you could do better than this. I've seen the rest of the movie. I, I don't know why you're selling yourself short like this. And then she turns around and, you know, asks Sean. And it's it's just, it's so silly. It's, it's yeah. And later on, I think maybe in connection with when she gets with Lucas or something. I, yeah. And Catherine makes fun of Sandy. You know, she, like, Sandy says, Ugh, I, I wouldn't be, you know, I would hate to live there. And then Catherine is like, well, I don't, I don't think you'd fit in. You'd have to go pretty far to get a pedicure. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good dig. And Catherine thinks that it's okay for her to make fun of them the way they make fun of each other. And clearly Sandy is not into it. And, you know, part of it is also that Sandy just made fun of the town that Catherine is from. So now we know why she was so eager to move out and you know more eager to move out than her father was to let her move out and let's see. so yeah i'm not going to be calling out every single time the movie does pulls off a great scare since as i mentioned in the review itself it does a really great job of those i'm mainly going to be focusing on when they do a bad job actually later on i did decide i wanted to call out some of the really good ones so in the nightmare, Catherine sees herself as the evil spirit, which I guess is sort of foreshadowing her releasing it. But then, I mean, it's not like the evil spirit is known for... Wait, is that... Is the evil spirit making her see these things? Because later she has like this flashback nightmare of the gang rape of the evil spirit. I really wish they had given her a name so that we wouldn't be calling a gang rape victim evil spirit, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to call her. That's, that's literally, that's what they call, you know, the characters and the end credits in the movie call her the evil spirit. Let's see. I guess I could, yeah, I'm gonna really quickly and try to do it subtly as well so I guess that's why like so the evil spirit is making Catherine see certain things so that does that mean that she somehow knows that the ah, what's it called does that mean that she somehow knows that the hmm. oh and I guess this is the German remake that I uh, which means that if I go into the section I mean it must maybe it mustn't I guess it mustn't uh, let's see okay I'm gonna try to do another search for Let's see if I, there we go. Okay, so, yeah, I guess it's because the, I'm going to find, let's see, okay. Reke Lulot is the name of the actress who plays the evil spirit. Um, Ricky. So Ricky shows her what happened to her. For sympathy? I mean, we sympathize. See, again, if the movie ended with Rolf and Catherine intentionally unle unleashing Ricky on a, you know, un unsuspecting bullies, that would make a lot of sense, you know, but... And, and that's, again, like the... the okay, so just brief brief spoiler for The Ring 1. American remake. I don't know if it's the same in Ringu. In the Ring One, the the you know Naomi Watts ends up helping Samara, which at the end her voice says, "You weren't supposed to help her," you know, which is great, chilling. But the the it, it's like this thing of uh, let's see, because she comes to empathize with her because of all the torment that the little girl went through, and you know it's clear that she doesn't mean to, but 
then we realize she she didn't mean to when she was alive but now that she's dead she is intentionally you know hurting people so you know i guess for this movie they thought well we gotta make the protagonist empathize with the ghost right because that's how they do it in the ring anyway no more spoilers for the ring for the time being I mean, the foreshadowing, is it that Ricky is making Catherine see, you know, have, have this nightmare where she sees herself as Ricky? Yeah, it's like, like I said in the IMDb review, it doesn't really add anything. It just, it just confuses you. You know, it's, it's something like that. Because again, if the movie ended, maybe it did originally end with this really dark twist that Rolf and Catherine were using the the using Ricky to get back at, at bullies at various places, but yeah, like that would make it make a lot more sense that Ricky saw so that Catherine saw herself as Ricky, and yeah, Sandy and Lena briefly talk about Lucas, and it's clear there's some some background there and. Lena says it would be wrong for her to have sex with Lucas. If Catherine knows that she's clumsy, why did she pick up something so obviously breakable from Sandy's bathroom when she knows that Sandy barely needs an excuse to hate people? See, this is the problem with the movie. Nobody acts like they realistically... I'm sometimes clumsy, so I'm extremely careful when I pick up something valuable. You know, I wouldn't go into someone, to, to the bathroom of someone who hates me, and then pick up something, that, like, it's, it's, why does she, it just, it makes no sense. I guess it's supposed to be the movie setting up that she's clumsy, but then, I guess it's supposed to be the reminder, and we really didn't need the reminder so soon after establishing it, because I guess the establishing is that she dropped the, the lamp, which was Sandy bumping into her, it's just... And, and it's so easy, just remove it. She doesn't need to be clumsy because it has nothing, like, did she even do something that, like, the mirror doesn't start breaking it by itself? Did I miss something? Like, I get that she, like, she accidentally breaks the thing and then there's a little blood and she tries to wash off the blood. And then I think she, like, she, like, touches the mirror. Maybe, like, did, did some of the blood get from her finger on the mirror? somehow and then she's like she's trying to wipe it off and then the mirrors like it, it forms like this long crack and it's like sandy saw that did she all and, and she's like oh you know don't it's, the mirror was here before it breaks like that all the time i guess it's just it's so silly and it just later on she breaks the mirror intentionally that's what releases ricky there's no need for the mirror to start cracking and for Sandy to say, like, Sandy says, it's fine, that mirror was, or wait, was she talking about the thing that broke? There's no way, right? Because it's like, it like holds some, I, I don't know if it's perfume or soap or what. No, you get rid of a thing like that, don't you? If it's, like, if you move into a place and there's a thing there already with, like, or like empty it and put your own stuff in and then you do care if someone breaks it. Movie makes no sense. I And it would be so easy to fix it because the point is she breaks the mirror intentionally and then Sandy's like, you went too far. I know I said I don't care about that mirror, but this is just, you know, like, because it, like, if you only had, like, the prank and her smashing the mirror and then them, like, you know, isolating her socially, that actually kind of works. You know, it, it is this, like, because she goes in there and she sees the, she sees Ricky in the mirror, which I guess, okay, so I guess Ricky is hiding in that mirror, yeah, she's caught in that mirror, and she appears whenever someone is scared and in that room and looking in that mirror because she knows that if someone breaks the mirror she'll be free and it's just not happened before now maybe most people instead of running into the bathroom and hiding maybe they like start attacking the prankers and then they get kicked out for violence or something that's probably i mean i could imagine that rolf 
maybe they didn't do that prank at all, or maybe he ran out of the room somehow. Like, yeah, I, I could imagine. It's, see, parts of the movie work, parts of the movie do work. Now, the, the cell phone con conversation between Catherine and her father does ring very true. I think this is what they call helicopter parenting, and it also sets up that there might be something about Catherine's mother's death that might upset her, and, you know, that might be part of why her father doesn't want her to move out because of the mental health issues that, you know, that he fears she has. And, let's see. Yeah, so, so that's... But again, it's it's this thing of, like, at the end of the day, the fact that her mother... Okay, so her mother had mental issues and ended up committing suicide, and now she and her father, Catherine and her father, are worried that she will have a similar experience, and hence the stuff of her seemingly losing her mind over the course of the film. But that doesn't lead to anything and it doesn't really make sense because like you know other characters will like look in a in the mirror and see themselves with like blood on their neck and they'll be like what's wrong with you what do you, what do you mean what's wrong with her the mirror is the like it's just it's so yeah now <laughs> yeah i mean we never do for sure find out if the screaming and moaning was sex you know at at first it sounds violent, but then, it, yeah, I think at the very start it's just screaming. And Catherine's like, there's something wrong here. And then she hears, then there's some moaning, and then it's like, oh, I guess, that, you know. I mean, that might actually also be some more foreshadowing, because some people, you know, some people would say it's sex, other people would say it's violence. That's a good way to describe a rape, you know, so, yeah. If only they could have picked one specific thing and focused on that. Because when they do focus, they're really good, you know. And, uh, yeah, at this point, I know 20 minutes in, and, all, you know, we're almost a third of the way through, and the actual ghost plot has not actually started yet. We've just been told that there is something, like, a person died there under mysterious circumstances. And, you know, like, the there's the, the nightmare thing, but that's it. You know, one and yeah, and once the once Ricky actually does leave the mirror, not very much longer, not very long after that, she starts going around killing people, and then the rest of the movie is just her killing people, Rolf and Catherine. Ah, what's it called? Rolf and Catherine figuring out the the mythology by, you know, I mean some some. Yeah, like I said, there, you know, a lot of it is just kind of guessing, you know, they, the, the other than the fact that they've been told something happened in that room, and the the nightmare flashback, other than that, like, everything, and, and really, the nightmare flashback, honestly, could have been just, like, I mean, I sometimes have nightmares about some, you know, I don't wake up and say, there must be a ghost, and something that happened in my dream must have happened in real life. Like, let's see, let's see. Were they? Did they say before that point that there was like an attack on her? Maybe they did even say that it was rape. Actually, yeah. And that's okay. So fair enough. That's why she accepts that as true. But the rest of it is way too much guesswork there. Anyway. And yeah. So let's. See. The party is filmed and edited very nicely. Like, it's convincing. It really feels like you're there partying. And, you know, like, for for a while, it's just, like, it's it's fun. And then it gets to be a little bit too much. And Catherine has a nosebleed and the, you know, because of the cocaine. And then, you know, leads to Catherine and Lucas being alone. And Lucas claims Catherine won't make an enemy of Sandy because of sex. And then, you know. I'm not going to claim that I myself have experience on the subject, but international viewers might watch this movie and find it hard to believe that Catherine would have sex with a guy that she met. I mean, I guess it's supposed to be that same day. 
Let's see. I I have heard that a number of Danes do very quickly have sex with someone they just met if they like them, and I personally don't think that's wrong. I mean, I would say, unless you're 100% sure that you want to become pregnant, use, you know, some, some sort of protection, and, I mean, in general, maybe use some sort of protection just in case of STD or something, but beyond that, you know, and, and clearly, uh, Catherine did actually think that they were falling for each other. You know, it turns out that he's just a player, but she she didn't do it just, you know, whatever. She actually likes him. Now, let's see. But yeah, I know a number of Americans think that that's, like, completely unacceptable. Let's see. So... Yeah, so the lights go out, Catherine walks into room 205, again, another scare, and the, yeah, excellent sound design when we hear them banging on the door when she hides in the bathroom. I mean, when you really stop and think about it, they, you know, there's no one, no one's, like, banging on, on the door on set. They, like, went to, a, you know, they, they did it as Foley or something. You know, it when, when we see her, like, scared, and the, we see the mirror and Ricky behind her, so... There's not people out there banging on the door because you the no the the sound quality you get from that would be bad. So and you know anyway, and yeah, Catherine breaks the mirror that she sees Ricky in. She unleashes the evil spirit, Ricky. And hours later, Catherine wakes up. Turns out it was just a prank. And you know she asks how they did the thing with the going to the mirror. They don't understand what she means. And you know that must be the start of them thinking that she's crazy and it is like again like that that one time it does make sense like you know they're like we, we just we put on masks and we made kind of scary noises and she runs into the bathroom breaks the mirror and passes out you know and then she starts talking about she saw something in the mirror that none of us have ever seen you know i mean presumably sandy uses this mirror like at least once a day right you know, so it's it's like, yeah, the the, and that really is like, yeah. I mean, it it must be that you have to be in a state of fear in that room to see Ricky, yeah. So let's see the the, uh, what was it that I wanted to say? Yeah. So, yeah, now Catherine is just not in the social group. We're about a third of the way through, but at least we do now have the start of the proper supernatural horror stuff with the mirror. I don't know why she didn't ask them how they did the thing with all the lights going out. I'm not 100% sure how you do that in real life without, like, rigging something up. Like, it seems like a lot of work to do just for, for like, a scare there, but let's see. You know, so, so why does she bring up the girl in the mirror? You know, she does bring up, bring up the girl in the mirror, so clearly there was some stuff that, you know, seemingly related to the prank that the other students didn't do, but some of it's called out as something they didn't do, and some of it isn't brought up at all. I, I'm guessing maybe it just wasn't in the script, and then they realized they could do it, so they didn't, you know, so they, they did it when they filmed it, and they didn't put in a line acknowledging it, so some of the others wrote, call me mom, and put a, a photo of, I mean, that's got to be Catherine's parents, because certainly that does look like that's her father. So I guess some of them went through her stuff. That's really creepy. Some, sadly, I have heard of that, of bullies, you know, digging through personal belongings. I'm not 100% certain if we're supposed to think that Catherine is rude to Rolf, or Rolf is being creepy. I mean, I guess it's rudeness. We're supposed to take it because she's upset about the prank and, you know, the fact that, it, and, and combined that with the fact that she's been told that he's weird, I was going to compliment the use, the movie, on good use of focus shifting and it's somewhat untraditional two-shot. You know, no, normally when you have like a two-shot, it's like two people talking, but here, you know, like in, in part of the image, you have her face and then another part of the image, you have him sitting there, 
and like looking at his stuff and then looking up and looking down at stuff, you know. The fact that, you know, I, I like the fact that we can see both of them and it'll have only one of them in focus at the same time rather than a split diopter. But again, as with too many Danish movies, it just gets pushed too far. It goes on for too long. They should have trimmed at least one instance of her looking back at him and him looking down, but having, you know, having looked until she looked back at him. So we realized Lucas is a player, and Sandy makes Lena take out the mirror for the trash. And she sees blood on her neck in the mirror. And I think Catherine sees it as well. I kind of thought that the idea was that that's visible only to the person that the evil spirit that Ricky is targeting. And then for some reason, Lena says that Catherine is weird. It's Does that mean that Catherine saw Lena in the mirror with blood on her neck? and being upset, but in reality, Lena was just sitting there. This movie needs to do a much better job of establishing someone's perspective on some something like that. It's kind of a big deal. And I, I think they did a decent job, you know, creating, like, she goes into the, like, laundry room and, like, an open container of, like, uh, what's it called? Laundry detergent? Like, you know, it, it falls over, and that's like, they they probably had like a string or something to, to pull, you know, but like, you see it, and like, you know, if, if you saw something like that in real life, I mean, you might think, well, how did that happen? But like, Lena, you'd be like, I'm, I'm going to pick that thing up. I don't want, you know, someone else is going to walk in. If I don't do that, someone else is going to walk in here hours later, and there's just going to be this massive pool of laundry detergent on the floor. And the longer that stuff is allowed to rest, the more nasty and difficult to remove it becomes. It's just like, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna pick it up and put it back on the table. That's not a big deal, you know. It's not, you know, it's not costing her any money. She's not in a huge, you know, it's not like she's being chased by a killer or something. And then, you know, the, the you know, she, she, like, checks for the source of, of the noise, and she turns around to look, and then we see the evils, the, the Ricky behind her. And, you know, Ricky chases her into the hallway. I like that Ricky somehow had a head, like, got ahead of, like, you know, if, if Lena comes running from here, this direction, and suddenly Ricky is just here. Very Freddy Krueger. I like that. That's, yeah. And Lena does try to call someone on the phone for help. But then there's this screeching noise on the phone. See, this is how modern horror movies should write out access to cell phones. Don't have them just, like, weirdly out of battery or no signal when that makes no sense. It's just... See, sometimes this movie really just nails what it's going for. So, yeah, we're almost 40 minutes into, excuse me, into the movie before we get the first proper sighting of Ricky. And that really is, like, the first... Like, I guess the... Yeah, the first half is this drama, and then the last half is this horror movie. Maybe not exactly half, but yeah. And Lena's death is perfectly decently done, and I do think, like, you could, you could understand why they blame Catherine, because it does look like someone walked up, like, someone pushed her, and then she fell back, you know. Actually, I forget, did the... Did Ricky, like, grab her and throw her, or... I, I, yeah, it's... I don't remember exactly, but it does... You could understand how others would think Catherine stalked her and, like, went up behind her and, like, pushed her into the, you know... But then, like, the elevator kill... There, it makes no sense that someone would think that somehow Catherine did that. And, you know, the the... Yeah. You know, Sandy and others think that Catherine did shove Lena into the, you know, to, to kill her, to upset Sandy. To, to get back at her for the prank and the various bullying incidents. And 
Catherine talks to Bob again, and he goes into why he moved. Gives us something up the bullying. Rolf and Catherine agree to meet later at six, but then they don't agree to a place. I mean, he. I, I guess he's supposed to go to his own old room since that's now her room. Now, I, I do feel like it makes sense that Catherine is, you know, like talking to Rolf now that she knows how bad the others can be. But then she knew that the first time she met him too. But then I guess maybe she feels bad about how she treated him there. And certainly, like I said earlier, like, She's she's upset because of the bullying. She she knows that she's now being socially isolated, and she has you know. So yeah, she's upset from that, and so she she punches down basically. And they talk about the ghost in two hundred five. Sandy clearly doesn't like that Catherine brought took Rolf to the dorm, and then Rolf is like, okay, I'm not. I don't want to play these games with Sandy anymore. And, you know, it, it does seem a little bit like that's what Catherine is doing. And, yeah, and they talk about mirrors. I'm almost certain what Rolf says about mirrors trapping souls. That is something that some people actually have believed. I guess maybe some people still do believe. And that, let's see. Yeah, that is actually why Ricky was in the mirror, why she's free now, that that mirror has been broken. And Catherine hears Lena's cell phone and finds Lena dead. So I guess there were some hours between her death, you know, in, in the hours between Lena going down, down there and, and Catherine finding her, no one went there to do laundry. That makes sense, you know, the, the, it's, it's, all, it hasn't been, like, if it had been days, I'd be like, there's gotta be at least one person who would do litter laundry in, in this amount of time, but I, it, it, you know, it has only been hours, and Sandy blames Catherine for Lena's death and says, you know, oh, you didn't find her there, you killed her there. When when Lucas came to, to Catherine's room, I almost MST3K'd him saying that he came to her for sex after Lena's death, but I thought it was too ridiculous of a joke. And then it turns out that was actually what how they wrote the scene. Like, it's... it's What? No one acts like this. I don't care how big of a player you are. Nobody acts like this. Like, I could believe it if he was hitting on another girl now. But he's not going to go to her and try to get sex after he just, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. And let's see. Yeah. And then again, the, the mirror thing. And he says, Sandy's right. You are a psycho. How do you think that she's doing this to the mirrors? This is really getting ridiculous. Of course, they're going to be weirded out by the mirror thing. But why would they blame it on her? Why don't they say do you know what's going on? Which they actually, you know, like, a little later in the film, they actually do, but it, is, it makes no sense that they're always like, I, I can't believe you're doing this weird mirror thing that I've never seen or heard of anyone being able to do before. You're weird. That's what's going on here. There's nothing supernatural here. And Rolf brings Catherine Newsby who's ruling that the ghost actually did die in there. Not 100% certain if Ralph is saying that most mirrors are good or most mirror memories are good. And Lucas bro blocks Rolf in the hallway and you actually do kind of wonder if he's going to beat him up like Lena's, you know, just talking about Sandy trying to make him do earlier. Again, decent enough, Lucas. Like, I, I, I couldn't completely remember from the first time but I think even so, like, there's this sort of tension that, like, of all the people that could be blocking, you know, it's it's not Sandy blocking, it's not, uh, okay, actually, to be fair, Rolf, Sandy, Lucas, and Catherine are the only characters left that have names, so I guess it could only be Lucas, but the bit about 
oh, once Sandy tried to get Lucas to beat up Rolf, them saying that earlier, they didn't have to put that in the movie. You know, there's it's a decent payoff to that. And the elevator doors slide to a close and you briefly see, you know, Lucas doesn't. Apparently, Ricky is behind him and she's like, she was like crouched down and standing up. Very, very cool. I'm not sure if I think it's good or bad that, at, like, not very long afterwards, he turned around and can't see her. I mean, she clearly can move, like, extremely fast and, like, disappear and reappear kind of thing. Thinking about it, I'm not entirely sure how Lena managed to outrun Ricky in the washing room. Like, Ricky was right behind her. I guess she just wanted to give her a head start. Like, we're not actually shown anybody being able to hurt Ricky. The, you know, they can get her back into the mirror, and they can try to outrun her, but they can't hurt her. No one is able, ever able in this movie to hurt her. The elevator kill is pretty good, pretty cool effects, very, like, it must be a really horrifying way to die, both the anticipation and the actual crushing pain. This is definitely a death that it makes no sense for the others to blame on Catherine. That's, like, what do they think? Anyway. And Catherine sees what actually happened to Ricky. I mean, essentially, for the first third of the movie, it's a drama about college bullying and social groups, and then the last chunk of the movie, it's almost only about the ghost, with, like, just one major character dying after another. They should have done a better job with variety. Like, once people start dying at the hands of Ricky, it's like, I don't know, do ten minutes of the movie pass without at least, with, yeah, without one major character dying, and then once... Sandy is dead, there's some attacking of Rolf. I guess only Rolf, right? Catherine, because so Catherine can do the mirror thing. So the reason she was driving the mirror was because she was right, right in front of it and then died right in front of it with blood covering parts of her face. So that's why what the evil spirit shows her, what Ricky shows her victims in the mirror before they die is blood on her, on the face or the neck or such. Let's see. And so, you know, some of this clearly, like, they put effort into, they, they tried to think of, like, a sort of logic for it. And I'm really not sure why it is that Catherine is the one who's shown the flashback. I mean, the one thing I can think of is that the evil spirit recognizes that Catherine's bullied by a group of people and, like... Maybe Ricky sees it as sufficiently equivalent, like, bullied by a group of people, gang rape, they're, they're similar enough. I mean, certainly they are both victims of groups of people doing awful things to their peers, but then, like, why didn't Ralph, like, I mean, presumably they did the same prank that they did to her, and he doesn't seem to have, like, a much stronger constitution than her. I mean, the one thing I can think of is that I guess he didn't break the mirror and, like, I mean, okay, maybe she can see the future and she knew that she, that Cat, maybe Ricky can see the future and knew that Catherine was going to break the mirror. I don't, you know, nothing in the movie says that that can't be the case, but I do think that we should have a little bit more of an idea of what it is exactly. Now, let's see. So Rolf guesses that it must... That, that the way to, let's see, yeah, they must have to put Ricky back in the mirror and fix the mirror. I mean, I guess it's a decent explanation and reasoning, but it is still like, I just wish, look, I get it. Nobody likes watching a horror movie and seeing the character go to, you know, go on Google and type in the thing that's bothering them and see a bunch of really fake results. I get that. I'm not saying that I don't get that, but I I think it would have been preferable in this situation. Like, he's like, well, okay, so mirrors can trap souls, so if a mirror breaks, the soul escapes. Well, that must mean that they get trapped again if you just fix the mirror. I mean, okay, I was with you until that last bit. How did you get, like, I get it. 
Ricky died in front of the mirror. So for a while she was trapped in the mirror. The mirror broke. She's no longer trapped. How do you get? What we have to do is fix the mirror and then show her the mirror. And that'll trap her again. Like, I mean, and, and that again, like, think of how much cooler and what, how much of a darker story it would be if it was, if that wasn't enough. If they had to recreate trauma or something. Yeah, okay, so for that, it definitely shouldn't be gang rape, obviously. But, like, if, if it was, like, bullying and then, like, it went a little too far and she accidentally died or something so that they had to, like... Yeah, so the Catherine and Rolf, as two bully, you know, as two people who've been targeted by bullies, have to bully Ricky and watch her pain and anguish and just push through it until finally she gets trapped in the mirror again when, once they once they kill her again or something. You know, that would have been, ah, that just, yeah, that would be such an effective horror scene, you know, but, like, it makes sense to say... If, some, if someone is trapped by a thing and you break that thing, they might be able to escape. But it doesn't make sense to say, all you have to do is fix the thing that was broken and then they have to be near it. Like, it's not like they have to push her through the mirror, which, again, would have been a fairly cool thing, which, uh, I mean, I can't... Uh, okay, so there's there are horror movies that have something like that, but if I start talking about them, even if I say I'm spoiling them, I'll be spoiling that it's but yeah that would have been a really really cool anyway now <laughs> what are you doing here better question who are you what is th this woman literally doesn't appear in any other part of the movie at all I'm, i mean maybe she's there with the goon squad like a scene or two later but like not sure why they didn't just have sandy go like is like is this like in that movie, The Room, where there was supposed to be other scenes with that character, and that's why they act like they like we are supposed to know that character. Like it's it's just what is, what is that? Why didn't they just have like were they shooting other scenes and the actress was busy or something? Just yeah. Why does Catherine threaten Sandy with one of the shards of the mirror? I mean, no wonder that Sandy is going to believe that she's a killer now, and and she's still like in the. You know, when they're in the laundry room next time, she's like, we gotta fix that mirror, otherwise, you know, Ricky is just gonna keep killing people. We have to... Oh, by the way, I, I, I shouldn't have tried to slit your throat. I, what, what can I say? It's been one of those kinds of days. It's just... Yeah. I, now I know. Now I know why. Because it's supposed to be... Oh, part of the movie is that Catherine is losing her mind. And for sure, that, that's... That's not okay. Don't don't do that. Not even to a bully. That's that's messed up. But like again, it's just it's these weird things where, yeah. I agree with Rolf that the mirror has to be complete for them to trap the evil spirit in it. But why does Catherine not realize that without him telling her? This is one of those things where the screenwriter needed it to be said out loud so so that the audience would know. So he chose that the characters talk in a way that doesn't make any sense. You know, it's not it's not quite the same thing as like the you know a bunch of a bunch of movies and TV shows will have like characters start to talk about something that both of them already know about you know like lecturing each other on certain rules so that the the audience will know those rules Let's see. okay so the door clearly wasn't actually closed when Rolf broke through it, but I really don't blame them for not having an actor, more likely a stuntman, break through a door. And the sound effects do a decent enough job, I guess. You don't think about, you know, the awkward way that the, the they filmed it, you know. It's like really, like, I think what they did, it, at first it looks like he does bump against a wall, a uh, uh, door. I'm pretty sure what they did was there was someone holding the, the handle behind the door. And once, once he hears the actor bump into it lightly first, he opens the door very quickly so that when Rolf, so that Rolf can just run through, and it looks like he, you know, and and with sound effects of a door breaking, it seems like he actually did. Yeah, I don't hate the idea that they have to go into Sandy's room to get the last shard of mirror. That does kind of make sense, and they retrieve 
you know, the, like basically Sandy wasn't careful enough to, or did it turn out that the, that she was, as I, I forget, I might be, anyway, and, you know, they, they retrieved the mirror from the garbage that we saw Lena put in, wait, Catherine and Rolf did not know that that's where she put that, we know it because we saw it and we saw Sandy say it, but, you know, Sandy definitely didn't tell Rolf and Catherine that. I mean, I guess, okay, so, I guess when Catherine walked past, she, yeah, because she saw it was a broken mirror on the floor when Lena, like, saw her, her neck with blood on it. So she's like, oh, that must be the mirror I broke. And and she figures that she threw it in the trap. Okay, yeah, that that does make sense. Sandy has a goon squad. Literally, not a single person pr present. Like, maybe the dark-haired girl is seen in any other part of the movie. This is hilarious. Like, what? E what is this? They haven't appeared in any other. Are are these? I mean, I guess they're supposed to be like fellow students, but like, I I. It's it's amazing. Like she, <laughs> Sandy literally walks out like a crime lord, and like you know she has all these like I, I don't know four or six people total that like hold the two people that she, you know, ah, what's it called? Yeah, you know the the two people that are her enemies now. You know it's like what is what is going on? Come on, it's it's because they. They wanted a scene of Sandy, like, threatening um, Catherine with the shard. And they wanted Rolf to not be able to intervene, but be present, so they had to invent these goons. And it's hilarious because they... It's one thing that they haven't been established before, but they also don't show up ever again. Like, Rolf, like, breaks free from them and then runs down the hallway, and they're gone. Like... If I was one of the goon squads, I mean, maybe they don't like Sandy, maybe that's why, but if I was one of the goon squads, I'd be like, Sandy told us to hold him, we, we gotta, we gotta pursue him and stop him, and it's like, I mean, if you just had a thing of like, oh, he locks the door, and they have to get a locksmith, to, they, they don't want to, you know, get hurt trying to break down the door or something, but no, they just run, he, like, I, I get that, you know, at first he's not quite emotionally excited enough to, to rip himself of, of, you know, of, you know, to get free from them. But once they, once he gets free from them, they just stay there and they're never seen for the rest of the movie. It's just, yeah. I'm just not sure what it was that Sandy thinks Catherine did to the elevator to kill Lucas. Does she think that Catherine is the one who put a dolphin brain in charge of the elevator? Perhaps if you actually know what I'm referring to there. But, but yeah, you know, the one reason that the Goon Squad did not go after Rolf is that the movie kind of needs them to not have, because there are more of them than there are of him. And, it's, yeah, it's, just, yeah. So, Sandy is literally now stalking around in a room, wielding a sharp instrument like a slasher, sl slasher villain? Slasher villain. This is ridiculous. It's just, wow. I brought that stupid piece of glass for you. Oh, great, thanks. <laughs> Why did she call it glass? Why doesn't she say mirror? I mean, I realized that part of it is like mirror. Is mirror part glass? I, I, I think it is, yeah. But like, nobody refers to glass. Nobody refers to mirror as glass. It's just, yeah. And Sandy sees blood on her face in the mirror. Holy crap, she apparently didn't think Catherine did that. She actually yelled out, what's going on, instead of, what are you doing? So, the scriptwriter does know that that's an option. So I don't know why he didn't do it with the other ones. It's like, if anyone has a reason to think that Catherine is dangerous, it's Sandy. Catherine put the shard against her neck. Like, if <laughs> the other two... We're like, oh, you must be crazy. You broke a mirror because you were afraid. 
so Ralph breaks the mirrors because he sees the evil spirit in them, and why is that suddenly how it works in this one scene and never any other time, Scott? I mean, it, any other time? Like, Ricky got out because a mirror got broken. This is the one time she actually appears in a reflective service right before attacking someone. All the other times, it's that the person who's about to get attacked by Ricky sees blood on their face or neck or something. And, you know, they apparently, they, they say something like, oh, she can move between the mirrors. That's news to me. I thought she just, like, it's, and that's, that's the thing, like, Sandy sees it in the, in the, in the mirror that Ricky was trapped in. And so did Lena. But I don't think that Lucas did. So it's like, they almost got there. It would make sense if every time someone looked at a shard of the of Ricky's broken mirror, they would see their own death, and not long after, Ricky would attack. Almost as if it's like, ah, what's it called? Like like if you touch the mirror, if you look in the mirror, that is is like that attracts her attention or something. Not gonna lie, the actual fight between Catherine and Sandy over the shard of mirror is legitimately tense. And I love the detail that it gets squeezed so hard. I think it's Sandy, like, you know, yes, it's it's in Sandy's hand. Gets squeezed so hard that blood starts pooling out, you know, just, yeah. Really, really good detail. And Catherine has to, like, what's it called? Like, um, pull the mirror, the, the shard of the mirror out of Sandy's eye. And we get this just perfect, disgusting noise as it happens. And then there's a tiny bit of goop on the mirror that she has to, like, wipe off with her face. That's awesome. That is that is very good gore. Was that the eye? I think it might actually have been the eye. Like, she's, okay, I don't need the eye on the mirror. Here. There we go. Thank you. That is disgusting. That's very, very good. See, that's, yeah. As long as she can jump between the mirrors, we can't fight her. So that's why he broke the mirrors. And I guess that means that the only reason she could attack the others was the reflection in the mirrors. I feel like I should give props to the fact that... Let's see... It, yeah, you know, both Sandy and Lena saw the bloody reflection in the original mirror, in shards of the original mirror. But I'm almost certain that that wasn't how Lucas saw his own death. I'm almost certain that was in a different mirror. I don't remember for sure, but like Lucas was with Catherine at that time. I don't think Catherine had any of the mirror left because that was bef it was before she started collecting the shards with with Rolf. That they did that after Lucas died. So yeah, is that the only mirror? I'm gonna break the mirror. You have to trap her in the mirror. I'm 100% behind the idea that, you know, she escaped from the mirror and maybe she can be trapped behind one, but was it really that she escapes some mirror every time that she attacked the others? Is this... And, of course, now that Ricky is attacking someone we want to survive, she's being really slow about it. It's like, she was actually taking her time with each of them, stalking them and such. So... There was one more mirror to break, but because it was in a closet, they didn't realize it first. That's a decent twist to the scene, not plot twist. Why can't she jump between mirrors except if she's trapped in the original mirror? I get why the original mirror, you know, could trap her. I maybe mean, hypothetically that's why get why it could trap her again. But I don't get why all the other mirrors are not like open doors to her. I feel like Either mirrors trap her or they don't. I, I it's, yeah. And again, I look, if this is a movie about Ricky being able to leave a mirror and then attack you, they need to do more to show that because it doesn't I don't think did she ever come out of a mirror in any I'm almost certain that every single time she appeared, she wasn't coming out of a mirror. There were a couple of times where we saw her in the mirror, but then, and that's also like the first time we saw her in a mirror, 
it was in Sandy's bathroom, and that was the mirror she couldn't escape on her own. The other times, apparently, what like, that's the thing. When we see Rolf, like, going up and breaking mirrors because he sees uh, Ricky in those mirrors, that was how she got free in the first place. She was seen in a mirror. That mirror was broken. Why does it... Why is it now how she appears, and now it doesn't give her more power to break those mirrors? Because he clearly does it certain that it's going to help them in the fight against her, rather than the other way around. Let's see, there was the, there's one other thing I wanted to get into. Right, see, the... Okay, so, yeah. Spoilers for the, the ring one. When we see Samara, she is crawling out of a TV. Sometimes we don't see very much of it, but she attacks. A TV will come on and show the well, show the, you know, show the the circle of light, and that. That's how she she you know. But this one doesn't show something similar. It's not just that. I guess maybe what's supposed to be equivalent in this movie is seeing your reflection with blood on your neck or face. But again, it's just, it's, but it's not. Eh. I mean, okay, I guess that's okay. Fair enough. No more spoilers for the ring for the time being. So when Ricky attacks Rolf, it shows that she doesn't only attack bullies and gang rapists and such. And I do feel like that might have, it might have been a good element if there was that limitation. And it, it is legitimately, like, the, the climax is exciting, you know, the, her, like, pushing her hand down his throat, that's really messed up, that's very, very, yeah, you know, and the, the, yeah, you know, the whole thing, and, and she, she breaks the other mirror, and she holds up the mirror, and, you know, Ricky screams, and, and is like, you know, and, then we see that the mirror is now whole. It, it doesn't look like it's been glued together like it did right before. So that's a it's very, very effective, very nicely done. So Ralph is put in a mental health facility. I'm not entirely sure why he's there, but Catherine, like, you know, Catherine is, is you know, she, she, she has to go and, and he has to stay in the mental health facility, I think. I don't know, am I misreading the white coat people? Why is Catherine smiling so much at the start of that scene? Like, I... I mean, I guess the reason why he was the one who ended up in an institution was the physical attack there at the end, which Catherine didn't experience, but then the other, like... I, I, yeah, I don't think it... Ugh. Okay, I gotta rush through. Okay, the, the... Yeah, I, I believe I've said anything I want to about that. The ending scare really does make absolutely zero sense, but I'll be talking about that in the section after this one, so not getting into it now. So Rolf talking about mirrors being able to trap people's souls is what actually happened with Ricky in the, mo in the movie. But they don't actually say which culture believes that, you know, what, what people believed it. So it's hard to see why that would be how it works for Ricky, since different people believe different things about mirrors, I mean, you might as well say that it's Silent Hill Origins rules, and regular people can travel between the well, people uh, who have been attracted by Silent Hill can travel between the mirror world and the, you know, yeah, the other parts of the world, you know. Again, in a movie like The Ring, everything is completely specific. By the end of the movie, you know exactly why those different aspects of the videotape and the curse attacks are the way they are, but here, I mean, it wouldn't have been that difficult to do, just, like, have it be that the woman, that Ricky did believe in that sort of thing, or maybe someone in her family tried to bring her back from behind a mirror, and that was what turned her into an evil spirit, but there's way too little in the way of explanation, and, like, I, I mean, holy crap, does that mean that according to this movie, like, I'm not saying, you know, it's not like, ah, oh, people are gonna believe it, I'm just saying, it's hard to believe this movie when it basically says that if something painful happens and you're in front of a mirror, and certainly at, at least if someone dies and they're in front of a mirror, 
that means that if that mirror breaks, that per like mirrors break. That happens, you know, every so often. Like it's are are we supposed to think that the yeah, I, it just, I, I really feel like they should have, or maybe it should have been a specific mirror. Like, the, the um, ah, let's see, a mirror that, like, grants you access. Like, it, you know, the, the original person who got that mirror intended to use it to spy on their enemies or something like that. And the, the well, let's see, so, yeah. Original person, spy on their enemies, hundreds of years ago. Okay, so, someone manages to kill, let's see, let's say it was a king or something. And they don't know the story of the mirror, so they just take it, because it's a fancy looking mirror. Why not, you know? And they try, you know, they go around trying to sell it. And, like, again, Rolf could be reading this from the newspaper. You know, I, I, did, a, I did a Google image search. For of of the exact design of the mirror because it's so specific, you know, and apparently it's like hundreds of years old, and you know they they went around they tried to sell it to people, but everyone they sold it to would like die in a horrible way, and then finally this one person said, "I know what's going on with the mirror, and I'm going to remove the enchantment," and it seemed to work, but she said it's important that if you know you you must never let someone. Ah, uh, let's see, if, if, ah, uh, crap, uh, let's see, if someone, if someone cries tears of agony while looking directly into this mirror, their soul will be trapped in it, and there's nothing I can do to stop that, it's something like that, you know, and, and then the, the, like, Rolf says that that's where the articles end, and then he had to, like, he had to talk to, like, like how in Sinister, you know, have have like some he, he like calls a college professor who studies this kind of thing and you know he he explains oh yeah i mean the thing they thought was this this and this and you know but they didn't put that in the article because they thought it was a little something you know so some so for some reason it didn't make it into the article and then like the, the uh, eventually like the a lot of the design of the mirror like sandy thought okay this, this is a bit ostentatious i'm just i'm just gonna cover it with like I don't know, stickers, whatever, you know, and, and then, like, when the mirror breaks, they, they, let's see, they take off the stickers for some reason, I don't know, they, they, you know, they take off the stickers and they realize it has this incredibly detailed, ornate design, and then they, you know, they, they look up that design, and it turns out that design, you know, this particular, uh, this particular group of people, thought that those, you know, those specific designs would mean that it could access other dimensions, you know, something like that, but just, it's a, it's a mirror, and some, like, I'm not making light of rape, that's, that's a horrible thing, but the idea that every single time someone dies in front of a mirror, it traps their soul, and I mean, again, according to this movie, if you're scared, and you look into a mirror that someone died in front of in pain, that means you can see the person who died. And if you break the mirror in fear, that means that person is now, that the, the spirit of that person is now free. Like, it just, you, you have to make it more specific. You know, again, in The Ring, it's the one, it, it's one videotape. You know, it's not like, and, and that's also, you know, I haven't seen the most recent one, but apparently in that one, there's like, like, a, you know, people all over are, are showing it and, Anyway, you you got to have some kind of limitation to it. Wait, some people say that the movie's about Catherine being clumsy, and I think an argument can be made that there's evidence in the movie that she is clumsy, but it never actually comes into play. The mirror breaking that releases Ricky was not clumsiness. She freaked out. She was scared, so she intentionally broke the mirror. Her being clumsy has nothing to do with the curse at all. Maybe originally the script had the breaking of the mirror be because of clumsiness, and then when it was changed, or maybe it was actually only in filming that it was eventually changed, they didn't make up for it in those other instances. Like, that's the thing. Like, there's so much in this movie where it's just, if they just made it a little bit, just refined it a little bit, it would have been great. But yeah, the movie is an hour and 24 minutes long without end credits, 27 and a half minutes with and credits, and that brings us to 
the next section. Notes taken before watching. So I am almost immediately going to get into the, yeah. So yeah, the ending scare really does make absolutely zero sense. Ricky is defeated by holding a mirror up to her, then the very ending in a nonsensical twist, now Sandy is in the mirror. She wasn't raped, it was just that Catherine has sex with her ex. And I mean, maybe it thinks that, like, it, it wasn't Catherine who stabbed, Sand, stand, stabbed Sandy in the eye. It was, you know, if it had been, it would have been, technically would have been murder, but also self-defense. But no, the, you know, like, I guess the movie is saying that the only requirement to become a mirror ghost in this uni movie movie's universe is for you to accidentally commit suicide in an at least somewhat tense situation, and possibly it has to be in a, bathroom because that's basically like there's there there aren't any other com comparison like sandy wasn't even bullied by anyone you know there's like one or two jokes at her expense but that's it she she's easily the least bullied person in the entire movie so maybe it's catherine's dad i guess but you know other than that of, of the youths it's the and let's see yeah you know basically Sandy was struggling with Catherine over the mirror shard. Catherine lets go very suddenly, and Sandy, like she's, she's pulling the, you know, she's she's hoping that at at some point she'll be able to wrestle it free from from Catherine and then hold it. But because Catherine just lets go, then the force with which she was trying to pull, you know, and she accidentally jabs herself in the eye, you know, she, the the what's it called, as a Let's see. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we know. And, and I mean, the ending shot. It's what? What even is the pro like? I know this is an ending that's supposed to make you think that oh, the the evil will continue, but it's presenting a problem that we've literally just learnt the solution to. You know, and what mirror is it saying is supposed to have been? Is is you know the one that. Sandy was caught in, I'm almost certain there wasn't a complete mirror in that room. That's why Ricky didn't attack, you know? Let's see. And Sandy won't even be released unless someone freaks out and breaks that mirror to unleash her. Seriously, if the movie didn't smash cut to the end credits, which, again, if you don't think about it, it's an effective jump scare. I figured that all that would have actually happened is that Catherine would get that mirror and hide it somewhere so that no one freaks out and smashes it. You know, it's just... And, and is it... Hypothetically, if she had been in a complete mirror, if she had been trapped in a complete mirror like Ricky was, then someone would have to break that mirror for her to appear in another mirror. Like, it just, it breaks every single established rule. Literally. Every single establishment. Like the one thing that the two of them have in common is that they died in a... Was it a bathroom? Was it the laundry? Actually, it was the laundry room. Yeah. They died in... <laughs> they, they, they accidentally committed suicide in a dramatic way in a tense situation with at least one other person involved. That's it. Like... Sandy wasn't trying to kill, she, she didn't even want to hurt, sorry, Catherine wasn't even trying to hurt Sandy, she just wanted the shard, you know, and, and then suddenly she lets go, and it's, she didn't mean to, yeah, it, it makes no sense, and, and the, and, and again, like, what, I think I thought that same thing after the first time I watched, I was like, well, she's just gonna, like, okay, I hear her screaming, but why would she break the mirror now that she knows how that works? You know, and yeah, it's just, it, it makes no sense. It literally, they, they spend this entire movie setting up all these rules and then they break all of them for this really stupid nonsensical, t yeah. So, spoilers for the American movie, the American, The Ring. Since the American Ring remake has a lot of similarities to this movie, I feel like this might be the movie that makes the most sense to compare it to. So, 
beginning of that movie is that you know like we we we're supposed to, we briefly think that Samara is satisfied she's going to stop killing people Naomi wants to the one thing she could think of to defeat Samara and it simply didn't work and you know once you realize that it seems like it might be impossible to defeat her and it ends with her and her son reluctantly passing on you know they press record they they pass on the curse to someone else because it's the only way they know how to save their own lives you know, it's, it's so much more effective. And think how, how easy it would be for this movie to simply copy that ending since they copied so much else from that movie. Instead of Sandy being in the mirror at the very end, reveal that she is now, that Ricky is now moving freely outside of the mirror. She no longer needs someone to see themselves bleeding in a mirror for her to attack them. Like, maybe she attacks Catherine without a mirror in sight. Or maybe after Catherine says goodbye to Rolf there at the very end, she walks up to a mirror, looks into it, and we see that her reflection is now that of Ricky. And, like, they, they showed that she managed to track Catherine's soul in the mirror. Actually, yeah, maybe she looks in the mirror, and, inst and, and we see, let's see. Yeah, so, so Catherine walks up to the mirror, looks in the mirror, and, you know, she, she has a sort of neutral face. And we see her reflection, and it's like, her, it's her face, but she's like banging on the like, no, let me out of here, that, that kind of thing. And then and then it cuts back, and maybe you see Ricky's face superimposed, and then it fades, and then we see Catherine smile wickedly, and then it, you know, fades to black, then it ends, something like that. Let's see. And again, something we didn't know was possible, and we and the characters legitimately thought that they managed to take out Ricky. No more spoilers for the ring. For the time being. I know some people will say that I'm reading too much into the movie for falling, so just to get that out of the way. I wonder if the idea is supposed to be that the reason that the evil spirit, just Ricky, starts attacking people is that Catherine having sex with Lucas and then being bullied is reminiscent enough of Ricky being gang raped. Maybe part of it is that Catherine's mother's suicide is reminiscent enough of the accidental suicide of Ricky. And, you know, ultimately we do see, you know, it does, it does go after Rolf. I'm not sure it really ever attacks Catherine, but it does go after Rolf. It doesn't only go after the people who wronged Catherine. You know, it, it like, hypothetically, it, again, that would have made sense if, like, it turned out at the end that Catherine released Ricky, and because of that, Ricky went around killing everyone who hurt Catherine. You know, because, again, if it did, if Ricky didn't attack Rolf, there in the climax, then it would, you know, you could actually have, like, you, you know, you could have that Ricky is standing there, and they're like, oh no, and then like, ah, uh, let's see, what if, I guess Ricky could just, like, maybe, maybe she bows her head, maybe she kneels in front of Catherine or something, and then Rolf is like, I think she worships you now. You, you broke her out of the mirror dimension. She's been killing people who hurt you, you know, something like that. It just, it would, it would be great. I really, that was, yeah. But, you know, at the end of the movie, it attacks Rolf, and you know, I, I would, I would sincerely doubt that he has ever bullied anyone, much less raped anyone. And. <laughs> Yeah, so I wrote the following based on reviews I read, not remembering what it actually was in the movie, but yeah, you know. Is this movie seriously about an evil spirit being released because someone is clumsy? And let's see. And it's also ridiculous that the ending has Sandy attack Catherine with a shard of mirror. Even if she thinks Catherine has killed some of her friends and her ex, why not call the cops? Like, what are you doing? You know, it makes no sense. I get that she would be, like, in a, like, in an intense state of mind, but, like, it's a lot. It takes a lot to actually attack someone with a deadly weapon like that. Now, and I, I do think the movie, you know, I guess I may have already mentioned that in the review, but I'll, you know, now that I'm talking spoilers... At the end of the day, I mean, other than Ricky herself, everyone we see killed, everyone we see die in this movie was a 
you know, an awful person, you know, a, a bully or a, a player. It's just the, these, I'm, I'm not saying you deserve to die if you are someone like that, but I'm saying, I mean, I'm, I know, not every horror movie, some slasher movies get a lot of mileage out of killing off the obnoxious characters, especially, but I just, I think, I think the movie would be stronger if there was, actually, yeah, tell you what, if, if for a while it's just, ah, you know, Ricky's killing evil people, and then near the end, like, it turns out, you know, like, uh, let's see, yeah, yes, uh, let's see, if, if Rolf, uh, let's see, yeah, okay, so, so, the, the, yeah, so, so Rolf thought that the, the mirror, you know, they could capture Ricky in the mirror and he tries and he's like it's not working I don't know why it's not you know it, it, yeah it's, some, it's, it's not working and and then Catherine like gets this really cold you know sinister look on her face and she says I know and he turns to look at her and and like let's see I guess you could do it with like flashbacks or something but you like reveal that this entire movie she knew about Ricky and she was like doing something to intentionally send Ricky to kill the others. You know, and actually, holy crap. And then you could flash back to every time someone saw the, the like blood on their neck or on their face in the mirror shard and then looks at Catherine and goes, you're psycho. And then, she, you know, like go back, show that when they were seeing that, Catherine was actually like smiling evilly, like, like <laughs> you know, just excellent. This this kind of you know body language that really says. And then it's like, oh, that's why they, th you know, that's what she was actually doing. We just didn't see that before. That's why they were reacting like that, you know. And then there at the end, like she has Ricky kill Rolf, and then like, and and at that point, you know. She she gets Ricky to go back inside the mirror, and then like let's see yeah and then you end it with like the the she's let's see yeah you know you right after that she she calls her father on the cell. Dad, it's it's not working out at this dorm. I'm I'm gonna need to find another place. Talk to you tomorrow about it. You know and and then it ends the way it began. On her, you know, blissful face, ethereal background, and, like, as she's driving towards another dorm, and maybe, like, have an overlay of, like, some, you know, some people screaming in pain or something, and smash, you know, smash cut to black, end credits, you know, there are so many ways to fix this movie. Anyway, so, yeah, the, the only YouTube video I found that wasn't clips of the movie or Apparently, just the movie in its entirety. Don't do that. They they work hard on it. They should make money for having made the movie. Anyway, other than that, the only thing I found were the the trailers, and I they're also on the DVD. So I'm going to be talking about them. I'm going to be talking about them right away because yeah, I'm going to talk about the DVD extras right away. And I'll get to the trailers pretty soon. But uh, let's see. I gotta go through a bunch of this. Let's see. Okay, so there's there's a commentary track. It's quite good. It's so so yeah. It's the director. It's the sound designer, cinematographer, and then the actress who plays Catherine. Let's see. Yeah. So the the right. They talk about the Catherine doesn't really belong anywhere. And the they used audio to make the dorm itself feel alive. And let's see. Uh, yeah, there, I know. Uh, let's see. 
yeah, they talk about that bullying is both psychological and physical. And... So, right, and in real life, the actors who play Catherine and Sandy are actually good friends. So it's really wild that they have to pretend to hate each other for the entire movie. And when they're, like, struggling and, uh, like, yeah, actually, when, when Catherine grabs Sandy and, like, puts the, the shard of, of mirror up against her, it it made it a lot easier that the two actresses know each other so like it's it's basically you know so they know how hard they can how how hard they can go the other will still be comfortable and when they're fighting over the the shard of glass it's actually the actress who plays sandy who's like deciding where the the shard goes and Catherine, the actor you know just just follows along and because you don't know that, you know, we, we it, it looks convincing to us. And let's see. Yeah, and there's the there's some behind behind the scenes stuff. And the cast very clearly understand their characters. And the actor who played Rolf had to smash a lot of mirrors. You know, he only smashes two in the movie, but he had to do a lot of takes. Said that it was fun, and someone else said it must be at least seven or eight, so 56 years of bad luck. And a lot of what they said I put in the review, and... Yeah, there's a 26-second teaser. I, I'm not sure I found that anywhere online, but it's like, it's sinister shots of flyers and just audio and, like, the camera moving and just it's very effective and the trailer itself like for a, a chunk of it it is like let's see the yeah there's there's some ominous stuff early on but other than that like there's this montage montage of partying you know just sex with lucas not at the party mind you and you know then it says the college dorm and like the text goes you know how it is or do you? That is so cheesy. And we see, like, flashbacks of the, you know, yeah, quick cuts of the of the deaths and the, the rape flashbacks and all of these things. And just, yeah, it's, that is such a ridiculous, is it called the tagline? When it appears in the trailer, I forget. But just, yeah, that's, wow. Anyway, that brings us to the final section which is called Critic Sites, MVB, and Wikipedia. And I'm just briefly, I, almost everything I put in the, almost everything in my old review, I, I put in the, in the review section. But one quick thing is, I've heard that if you break a mirror and then hold a copy of The Ring in front of it, this flick will be its reflection. That was the, my title for my old MVB review. So, yeah. I am going to skim through the various, so I, I'm marked stuff that I might want to, let's see, this one person said that they hated the sound editing, I really, I mean, there, there's like, a few places where the sound editing is bad, but almost all the time, it's amazing. Now, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, so this, okay, I think this is from Rotten Tomatoes. Not terrible, but the uh, user review, Chris, Crystal C. From 2008, not terrible, but there were major pacing problems. It took forever for anything to happen. Once it does, the majority of the background story and action is packed into the last 20 minutes of the movie. I did like the bleak atmosphere and the actors were all pretty good, but mostly I was bored. 
and one person here says it drove me nuts. The lip syncing or whatever was so off. That must be the dub because it's definitely not the original. The, the lip sync is spot on. If, I, I forget if they did ADR or if I, th I think a lot of the, the dialogue is on location. And such a okay, so this is the tagline. It's so unbelievably corny. Not everyone survives moving away from home. <laughs> That's so bad. Like, it's, it's just so bad. So bad. Like, I I feel like if if they if it had just been something like where your parents can't protect you any longer or something, but not everyone survives moving away from home. It's And let's see. Right. And yeah, so there are some reviews that I found via this movie's IMDb external reviews section. And let's see. Yeah, so there's 21 links in the section. I was able to copy in six. The rest of them are dead links, other languages, and such. And that's that's not a lot, but yeah. And usually I copy in the 100 most popular IMDb user reviews. Here there were only 21 total, so if you have bothered to review it. I mean, it has significantly more votes for the user rating, so I don't know why. But, but yeah, that's... Let me just really quickly... I know I didn't put it in the document, but it's possible I can read it in here. Um, okay. For some reason it went away from... Oh, there it is. Okay. 1,472 people have given it a rating between 1 and 10. Anyway, the... Let's see. So... One person gave it a 10 out of 10. And yeah, this is, there's, there's some really good. So this person says the camera work is often very tight, reminiscent of, very, of early Polanski and John Huston with occasionally unorthodox, but evocative framing. That's 100% correct. I, I agree entirely. Now, let's see. Yeah, there's a person here who said, yeah, heavily influenced by Asian ghost tales like Ringu or Juan. And I think Juan is the grudge. Or maybe Juan has a grudge against the grudge, but it's something like that. By the way, if you haven't, I actually, I'm not 100% sure it's still on, online, but if it is, it's, it's worth looking for and finding. If you haven't already listened through the riff tracks, it's ah, what's it called? Riff, riff tracks, riff tracks. Be best of, I guess. Riff, best of riff tracks for the Grudge, the American one. It's hilarious. It's incredible. I like that movie, okay, but the the riff tracks is incredible. But the, I mean, you know, that's not like I love. The Dark Knight, and I love its riff tracks, so it's not. And that's actually, yeah, those are all the things that I had noted, and I have been recording for almost three hours now. So yeah, I've pretty much, I've, I've said everything that I have to say about this movie, so I hope, I hope you enjoyed watching as I, yeah, enjoyed watching and recording. And I'll catch you next time.